Okay, well, good morning, everybody. It was nice and crisp this morning, but not as cold as it was last, last uh, yesterday. So, look, concrete is a hotbed of innovation, and it's driven a lot by um, the desire to have materials that are sustainable and also to reduce that carbon footprint. Looking at the components of concrete and just taking out the cement, all around the world, the labs are starting to look at how they can um, reformulate the cement um, and so that's less energy and less intensive. But looking at home here in New Zealand and looking at the company that we get our cement from, Golden Bay Cement, it is the only company that produces cement in New Zealand. And they're actually currently testing and looking at cement replacements. Um, and that's all under testing at the moment. And looking at Golden Bay, they've recently released their EPD in the last couple of months. I don't know if any of you have actually seen that, the first time a New Zealand company has released an EPD for cement. And um, notably, their carbon footprint is 15% less than the world norm. So, you know, they, they're doing really good. Hmm, that's not quite, form that's not quite yes. right, but that's okay. We'll carry on. So Firth has been um, manufacturing and supplying concrete in New Zealand now for 90, over 90 years. And you know, they've got many initiatives ranging from recycling their water, um, and we're currently trialling the first mach recycling machine in Australasia that will recycle concrete, return concrete 100%, and the only byproduct will be a block of lime, which will be destined for the farmer's paddocks. So um, that's under trial at the moment, so yeah, we're really, really pleased about that. So look, as well as that, Firth are Ecolabel certified. We've recently certified for ISO 14001. Looking and supporting at projects like um, Tuhoi, uh, Glenorchy Campground, um, the Ara building just here as well, um, and pro many, many more of the Marae projects. You know, the, the LBC uh, regenerative design principles really challenged us in our products. Um, and so now first, in their fourth year, um, hold 34 declare labels. So that would cover, that covers all their masonry, bricks, blocks, paving, and two certified mixes as well. So um, first in the world, and we still hold that. So, um, you know, in New Zealand, we punch way above our weight sometimes. And I don't know if that's gonna, kind of. So in the masonry part of things, um, they moved one of their masonry plants, one of their major uh, masonry plants from the North Island, and they took it out of an industrial area and they put it into a quarry. And what they did, it, it reduced huge amounts of truck movements on the road. You can imagine all that raw material coming in and um, actually carting it all over the country. So we actually use locally resourced material straight from the quarry. It actually comes from the dumper truck straight onto the conveyor belt and straight into the, the silos. So, um, you know, we're quite pleased about that too. So this, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but this is just a little bit about our declare. The declare covers 80 of our concrete plants and seven of our manufacturing plants. So we also have some systems that actually challenge the status quo as well. So the permeable paving, which manages your storm water and your peak flows, um, it filters and cleans your water and it recharges your, your um, natural aquifers. One of the other systems too is the next generation of rib raft floors. So the, it was designed for engineering for stiffer and for stronger foundations for your TC2 and your liquefaction grounds, which are starting to pop up all over New Zealand now. I think Rotorua was the latest, but that sinkhole that came through in somebody's garden. So while eliminating the polystyrene and the waste that that has created, um, we were challenged 
by the passive house and by Bob. And so by talking with Bob, we are back to the drawing board to um, not only look at the engineering and to keep the stiffness and the, and, um, for the TC2 and for expansive clays, but we're now actually now looking at how we can um, encase that concrete um, for your passive house and for your insulation. So, you know, and this is what's so fabulous about these forums, is that it gives us an opportunity to actually challenge, to talk, to actually make some changes, and the biggest thing is to act. So I um, hope you enjoy the, the workshop. Um, I'm sure they've got a lot to pass on in the next three and a half hours. So thank you very much. Tuhia kite rangi, tuhia kite whenua, tuhia kite nako o nga tangata, ko te mia nui, ko te aroha, tihei moriora. And um, I've been using that whakatoki for a little while because it goes to the part of um, what we're going to be talking about today and um, what myself and um, Bob is passionate about. It's about the quality of our relationships with each other and the land and it's about life. It's like what a nature, the living system. So um, we're going to do the intros in just a moment but Bernice it would be quite good if you came and mucked in and then you can take part and help out and join the conversation. Um, so First off, what drew you here today? Why have you come here today? So just have a quick conversation with the person next to you about why you're here. <laughs> and um, a second question. When we talk about sustainability, because we use that word, it means everything to every man and their dog. What are we talking about? What are we, you know, we, the sustainability is about sustaining something. So what is it that we're sustaining? Life. What do you think we should be sustaining or might life be sustaining? sustaining? Life, life. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Resources. Sustaining resources? OK. Is that, are you, is the cameraman going to contribute no, too? No, no, ah, yep. <laughs> Come on in. Just grab a seat and sit next to somebody because this is an interactive session, so you want to have conversations. Okay, so that's actually the right answer, life. We talk about green materials and we talk about green buildings and things like that, but fundamentally at the heart of all this is that we need to sustain life, and that includes ourselves because we're part of the living system. And, um, I think just this idea that we can be clearer in our language and clearer in our intentions is really, really important. And I think that's partly to do with why we haven't made a lot of progress over the last couple of decades, because we've all been doing our own thing. And individually, lots of people, you know, you guys have all turned up because you're interested in this thing. And individually, we can, we can influence and impact our homes, our families, the way we live and things like that. The real challenge is how do we start working better together so that we can all go in the, the best direction that will cause the biggest impact from, from the least effort and the least energy. Because we're busy people. We have to earn a crust, to take the kids to school, got to look after our, commu you know, our communities and our families and stuff. So how do we integrate changing the world into our daily lives? And that means we have to work with each other really well and better. And that's why the quality of our relationships is so important. So the purpose of today's session, who, who, who knew what the word regenerative meant when you signed up for this? Got a, yep, great, good, okay. So it's, it's gonna be interesting because we're gonna help explore what that means and also start to build your practice in regenerating. And that is the fundamental tenant of life on this planet. 3.8 billion years of evolution and um, we, me, Bob, you guys, are the result of that whole process. And um, it's quite amazing how life works because look at the complexity of us as a, as a living being. These different organs and these different systems and the mental, the lymphatic, the blood, the heart, the liver, the kidneys, all those things working in synergies to allow us to be, to be humans. And essentially with that core purpose of getting the DNA moving forward, but um, obviously we've evolved so that uh, we like to enjoy our lives while we, 
while we get on with the core purpose. So today's session is to reframe and elevate your thinking and approach to sustainability in a way that awakens your potential, your individual potential, and your motivation, your will to act on your potential, so that you can play your role and support higher levels of sustainability for your projects and your business to take care and responsibility for the future and for nature. Is that okay? Do you all agree with that? Yes. Good, all right. And then a couple of premises. So this is like the starting point of the conversation. So we can be more profitable when we serve all stakeholders, number one. We must offer value to all systems of life to be sustainable. Does that make sense? All systems of life? Starting to have to not think about humans for a moment. We're very good at thinking about ourselves and we create our environments as a sort of reflection of ourselves. But nature is a really key stakeholder in all this and is the, probably the most important system of life so that we need to be working in a way so that we're serving our clients, our communities, but also making sure that we're serving Papa Tuanuku, Mother Earth. We need massive change. Would you all agree with that? Yeah. Okay. And if we don't, who will? So there's a responsibility on all of us. It can't be business as usual. And there are many barriers and um, challenges and blockages to us getting there. And so we have to be conscious of that they're coming towards us. We're gonna, we've got a little part of the uh, presentation on that later. And we have to do it. And if we amplify and heal life, because it's not just about um, it's not just about getting on with today, we actually have to look at how we are going to heal some of the damage that we've done as well, as well as not doing any more damage in the future. Um, then we have a chance at sustaining our culture, our places, our cities, and the living system. So, oh, hello. Could I just challenge the first premise? Um, the word profitable and to me, that sort of suggests that that's the highest goal, or that you know, you put that first. That's sort of like the thing that appeals to people. And actually, yeah. we have to move away from that idea that profit and you know the bottom line <coughs> is, in financial terms, is the be all and end all. And um, so, just to explain, I'm not actually an architect. I'm a, um, I've worked in geology and also then um, planning, and then I've recently done yep. completed thesis in sense development design. And the thing that I found was that. Um, if you, I don't know if you're familiar with Tefariki, um, the uh, subdivision out in Lincoln that's been done by Naitahu Property. And they've done an amazing piece of work in wetlands and, and developing wetlands and pool walks and so on amongst that subdivision. Um, but it, it cost them more. It did cost them more. Their goals weren't just profit. Their goals were Presumably they made a profit as well, though. Exactly. So it's not more profitable but it's more equitable, more balanced. Sure, that's so the that outcome was the environment and some profit, but not profit at the expense of everything. And yep. that's where I challenge that first one. Right. That, you know, okay. It's looking at the balance between yep. your objectives and not having the highest profit as your only goal. And if you have your highest profit as your only goal, then you end up with what yep. you see outside. So if there's one thing I've learned of my, um, I, I pretend that I started this career at the age of eight, if there's one thing I've learned in that time is to not be judgmental, that profit's important, that the health of the ecosystem's important, that communities, healthy communities are important. And I guess that non-judgmentality allows me to see the essence of where people are coming from or companies are coming from better. And so that we can work with that essence rather than, so I completely take your point, but obviously we're trying to appeal to your um, you know, what your, uh, what's naked, naked ambition, you know, <laughs> we need to be here for a profit as well as I'm not the rest. I'm not that profit is yeah. important, but there has to be a balance. Yeah, and okay. If we don't address that pure yep. dollar ambition, yep. then we won't move forward. George. I, I completely agree. If you interpret the word or define the word profitable as financial, mm -hmm. which it is most commonly, yes. but profitable can refer to multiple currencies. So in, in our, here at Utter, 
We don't talk about bottom line or triple bottom line. We talk about multiple bottom line, which incorporates cultural currencies and those sorts of things as well that are identifiable and measurable. And I think that the premise of this discussion here today and that point is that if you reinterpret the word profitable as beneficial, as adding value to or zero harm to, yeah, I think then that the becomes a very powerful statement. Yeah, and it's, I think that's, you're right, you could choose a different word and perhaps your intentions are slightly different from the way that's read or would be read by most people. Cool. Okay. So I'll just do a quick intro to me. Jerome Partington. I have several hats, but the two main, the, 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 day, the day hat is that uh, I'm sustainability manager at Jazzmax, architects, urban designers, landscape and interior. And I have the morning, night and weekend job, and also Fridays, um, as chair of Living Future, Rakeora, New Zealand. And um, yes, I can definitely say that the energy that I have and the joy that I have is really falling into the living future space at the moment. It's feeling like the need is there, you know, that's where the work needs to be done. Um, long background, come from London originally, um, started off doing applied physics at university. That was my rebellion against my parents who were artists and, <laughs> and um, enjoyed it for a little bit, but then got into building, construction, painting, decorating and, um, and then architecture. And when I started architecture, green sustainability just wasn't even on the agenda. So I started hosting events at the college and getting speakers in and um, getting the staff along to them as well so that we could uh, get everybody trained up. And that had a certain profit element to it as well, which was very beneficial to a poor student. So that carried on and then I've been teaching and working and typically project led, you know, where an interesting project would draw my energy and attention and go and work on that for a while. And possibly the, the most enjoyable job I ever had was um, working for an architect who were also insulation contractors and builders. So we designed these amazing buildings during the winter and then during the summer we'd go out and run training courses and actually build these houses or community buildings and um, yeah, it was just wonderful working with architects, self-builders and students. So anyway, long story short, came to New Zealand, delivered several hospitals for Jazzmax, and then created the role of sustainability manager. And um, you know, I, it's been an evolution. My thinking has changed and adapted and grown over time as I've learned more and more. And um, you know, I'm very passionate and uh, experienced in this. So I hope to share that passion and experience with you today, help you grow your practice. And um, yeah, that's probably enough. So I'm going to hand over to Bob for an intro. Thank you, Jerome, and uh, kia ora, everybody. Um, I think a few a few people already know me, so just bear with me because I'm going to introduce myself too. But and I think it's good to sort of um, to set the scene and um, kind of talk about where where we've come from and um, what's led us to this point and, and what we've done. So. Um, Thank you, Jerome. It's an honour to be here with Jerome because he's kind of he's an amazing guy. He's a mentor. A lot of this stuff that that we talk about, a lot of time gets put in for free, and um, it's it shouldn't be because it's so important what what Jerome talks about, and um, you know even um, the uh, Diana Ergovortz, the um, vice president of the International um, Panel for Climate Change, you know she's talking about. This sort of stuff, um, it's everybody's doing it pro bono, and you know it's stuff that's done in the weekends. It's done late at night, and um, you know the kids don't like it. You know it takes us away from our family. So it's um, it's a great thing that Jerome is doing, and um, yeah, yeah. So my journey, really, I'm an architectural designer. I've been a part of ADNZ for since about 2000. I think I was um, member number. 2007 was my number, but um, anyway, um, this is really the start of this project was the, the start of my journey into sustainability, and um, you know I got to experiment on my own house, and um, and um, it really was great to have a, you know I didn't have any money, I was quite cocky, and I borrowed all the money to do this big expensive three level house up on the hill, and. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to experiment with, without having a client, with being the client myself, and you know, your own 
yourself as your client is probably the most difficult client, but um, that, uh, you know, that house there, sadly, um, after the earthquakes, it's unlivable. So um, I've been um, out of my house for eight years. And yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we got tipped, tipped out of our house and we got to experience what it's like to live in substandard homes. So, um, and that affected the health of my family. And, um, you know, I've got a seven year old, 10 year old. Um, a third of our seven year olds in New Zealand have asthma. And that's not okay. We need to do something about that. So, that's what led me to do a few things. So, I created or I initiated a rating system for earthquakes, which has um, been developed by a guy called Dr. David Hopkins, who's a guru for earthquake engineering. Firstly, for commercial buildings and then for residential, there is a, a working prototype of that. I then went, um, you know, um, I just thought, well, designing big flash houses for wealthy clients up on the hills, doing a handful of projects a year, um, it's not really going to have a lot of effect for people that are, thousands of people that have been tipped out of their houses. So I thought, well, we need to demonstrate that you can do a good, high performance, affordable build. And um, so this project here was the first 10 star home and it um, created a bit of furore and we used that media attention to launch the super home movement. And um, the super home movement's really about sharing ideas, open source. And um, the, yeah, so this is really super, super home number one. We did two homes, we did a single story home as well. And yeah, it, it sort of caught people's imagination and their attention and um, showed that you can do an affordable, high performance build. And I think it was a really important thing to, to do that. What year did you do that? That was in the world. Uh, that was almost four years ago. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, um, actually, about this time, four years, about exactly this time, four years ago, we did a, um, I travelled around the country doing a, a green design seminar like this. And um, there was a lot of interest because people were, it, it sort of pulled a crowd, the 10 star. Thing. And I also had um, Glenn talking about Passive House with me. And um, so we had, we filled the rooms. We had 100 people at some of those venues. And um, so it really got the word out there to people. Um, so that was great. And, um, you know, it was kind of like um, I was talking about Homestar. Glenn was talking about Passive House. So we were kind of like, you know. Because there's, there's sort of a bit of tension there between those two things. I like both of them, to be honest. And we're going to talk about rating systems later. Um, but, yeah, I think it's... Um, yeah, there was no blood on the floor. We got along well and had a good time. <clears throat> um, I'm actually just doing my first passive house right now. And, um, you know, I've been going to their conferences for about five or six years. Because um, it's all good. And, you know, you take the good bits out of different things and you know, living building challenge and, and different things and then you, you put it all together and you use what, um, what works for you. So I met this lady and um, we, we sort of uh, got her attention and, um, and uh, got an award for the uh, Sustainable Superstar, the S Sustainable Business Network. And um, so you know, she said to me, you need to talk to Phil Twyford. Have you, have you met Phil Twyford? I said, no, but I'd really like to. <coughs> um, so I met Phil Twyford. Um, well, I didn't actually meet Phil Twyford. I wrote to him, but one of my colleagues met him. And, um, but yeah, just before that, when Jacinda Ardern um, launched her campaign before she became the Prime Minister, she said, um, she quoted Norman Kirk and she said, um, there's four, she said four things, and what his speech was, what was it? Um, what we need is we need somewhere to live, um, someone to love, some meaningful work, and something to hope for. The first thing is somewhere to live, yeah. and I think it's really important. 
And it's a really big problem that we've got in this country, and I don't think the politicians fully understand it. They need to be educated. So I wrote to Phil Twyford. He didn't get it. So he wrote back to me and said, I'm all for improving standards, but not at the expense of housing affordability. And he talked about Kiwi Build, and I don't think he knew what Super Home Movement was. But, um, and Megan Woods, let's hope for better. Um, but really, they need to be talking to the right people to get the right answers. And at the moment, they're probably talking to the wrong people, the people that are interested in keeping the status quo mm -hmm. because they're fat, dumb and happy and making lots of money. Um, so that's my party political broadcast. <coughs> um, so yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell you more about the super home movement later, but I'm going to hand over to Jerome now. And really, the thing that has brought me to this is health and, you know, protecting our families. And, um, you know, that, that little house has led to some big things and led on to some quite um, large-scale projects. Um, it, it got noticed. Um, and some of those are the case studies that we'll look at later. Can I ask um, a question? You know, you mentioned before that house that you just did after the earthquake. Yeah. And you said it was affordable. Can you tell me what affordable means? What, what, what that cost to build? Yeah, so that was about uh, 450000 that house. But affordability, true affordability, is how much does it cost over time, as well as what is the upfront cost. And I 100% agree with you, it's just that I think some people struggle with that. You know, you've got to have yeah. the cash now, and that's what sets them back a little bit, is because yes, over the length of time, but banks don't back Absolutely, back yeah. You know, have the money up front to build it or don't do it, you know. So yeah. yes, I think a lot of people would love to do it, but it's just, it's, it is unaffordable because they can't, do yeah. it right now, and that's one of the challenges, I think, that... I think it is, you know, it's the biggest impediment. People yeah. just don't have the money, and... Um, it's not for, not, it's but, not for um, wanting to. Yeah, yeah, I think we need more incentives, and, um, you know, um, I'll touch on this later, but um, ANZ have intro yes. int introduced a healthy home loan where you get one, mm. up to 1% off your mortgage interest, so we need things like that. Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, here's a major bank that's taken, made a big move. We need government to do things too and introduce incentives. Yeah. I'd also suggest there is another way of addressing affordability and that is kind of what the, one of the drivers of today's sessions is about, that we look at things in isolation and, um, and couple that with business as usual expectations, it is very, very difficult to change. So your typical house might have a double garage, it's got quite a nice kitchen, might have three bedrooms, three bathrooms. And so two, two things come to mind, and one, one of them is really like at the core of regenerative development and thinking, is you actually expand the problem. Rather than focus on the objects and things, start looking at the system that it's sitting in. So for instance, um, if you design your housing development with your double garages and all the roading going up to it, you're investing a huge amount in the infrastructure. You're basically saying that the car is more important than your children's health. And so for instance, just, just by putting the car parking off to one side near the entrance and not including garages in the actual buildings themselves, you'd probably save 5-10% of the cost of a building. And then we tend to prioritise the, not so much the aesthetic, but the glitzy things, you know, I want my marble bench top in the kitchen, which, okay, you know, but what, what, you know, let's actually have a real conversation about where the value is. And the other thing around affordability is, um, what is the other thing I was going to say, Bob? I've completely <laughs> forgotten. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute, but just... Um, long-term cost, maybe? Yeah, long-term cost, but also just, yeah, what our expectations are around what, what actually is a house. And so, for instance, you know, designing a three-bedroom house with two, bedroom, two bathrooms rather than three bathrooms. Bathrooms are really expensive. You know, How much do you need? Yeah, quite. So really challenging ourselves and challenging our clients about, you know, what's the right solution. Most, ha you know, houses have grown in size. 30, 40 years ago, they're around 110, 120 square metres. Shifted over to the 200 square metres. And yet we live more isolated and separated lives and, you know, all that space just sitting there. Yeah, yeah. 
And there's another thing that um, the superwoman's movement really clarifies, and that is people can visit houses that are really high quality. So you walk in, and it's warm and dry, and it feels like you're in a house. Now, I'm from the UK, right? And when I first came here, I spent my first winter in Christchurch, and, and people were just, you'll be used to this. You're from Scotland. <laughs> I've never experienced anything like it because we don't live in uh, in these sorts of buildings. We it's cold outside, but when you get in, there's um you know a thermal envelope is is good. There's um central heating, and so I spent I was poor in my first year. I had hardly any money, and I rented um an old cold room in a flat, and I got sick. And I think the thing about what we spend our money on in New Zealand when we're buying a, an expensive house is um, quite a low quality building but with a big footprint. And yeah. I think that's where Superwoman's is useful because it shows you another another kind of standard. And once you've been in a space like that, you think, gosh, it'd be rather nice if I actually lived in something like this. Um, so yeah, and there's that conversation too. And let's be brutally honest, how many children have asthma in New Zealand? Th th Third. Third of children. It costs a lot of money to build a hospital, to have the medical staff and to have those children admitted to the doctors and everything. So we're simply displacing one cost from cheap, poor quality housing over to the healthcare system. So what's affordable, what's cheap? That again, expanding the problem and looking at the system. And that's what these guys really struggle to do, to see the interrelationship. So life is complex, not complicated. The major problems of the world are the result of the difference between the way nature works and the way people think. Didn't used to be that case. And this is almost an argument that completely ties in with our New Zealand evolving culture about how do we become indigenous to the places that we live in. This is the question. If you've lived somewhere for 800 years, you know how that place works and you know how much you can take, how much to give, how to manage that land, those forests, those lakes, that wetland, etc. And so in a sense, that's our challenge. How do we become indigenous in the places? What's, what is special about Christchurch that means we have to live and work in a different way around our comfort, our homes, the way we travel, the way nature works here, and start understanding that and be in relationship. And that's certainly how Tuhoi operate. I'm gonna talk about the Tuhoi building in a second. So how we think is really the first step. And just to give you a bit of a, this is quite a useful diagram to get the conversation started. Left hand side, conventional thinking, building code. Building code is the legal minimum standard for building a home or a commercial building. If you were to do less than that, you actually face the penalty of jail and fines. You know, it's criminal. That is the starting point. And then we've got into green and we said, okay, we can do a bit better. We'll just keep the market moving, but we can improve performance with a little bit less energy use, a little more health, a bit less water, but it really doesn't shift the dialogue and the debate. And then you can see that as you get greener, your, your energy and your social inequality is reduced. And sustainability is this sort of arbitrary space in the middle that not quite defined. And um, this, this slide I credit to Bill Reed. He's part of the regenerative, uh, Regenesis group in the States. He's been over here recently. I think he did an Auckland conversation, uh, Christchurch conversation. 250 people turned out to it, the biggest one they've ever had. And he would uh, posit that sustainability, a slower way to die. It's this sort of space that, it's sort of a neutral space that doesn't really exist. Doesn't, reflect how nature works. Then we get into restorative and it's like, oh, we've done a lot of damage, got a lot of problems, let's fix them up. But it's very unmotivating because somebody else caused that damage and why do I have to put the effort into fixing it up? Why is it my responsibility? Mm. On the right hand side is regenerative development or regenerating. And that the premise of that is that this is what living systems do. They constantly die and regenerate and die and regenerate and over time evolve more complexity, more capacity, more capability for more life. 
And what we're arguing is that we need to start getting into that space. That's where we can do the big hoary um, systemic changes that are going to allow us to um, get excited by the potential of our future and the opportunity <coughs> and also start linking up affordability, comfortable homes with healthcare costs, transport, our food system. It starts to help us understand how we address these problems at a systemic scale so we actually, small interventions can ripple out and have a wider impact. And um, for, simpli for simplistic sense, I've, sort of I've started calling it the footprint. So that's all the things we measure in energy, water, waste, um, transport, carbon. And typically, we're trying to reduce those. And if we're really well behaved, we might offset them. And then the footprint side is all the, th all the good we can do in the world, is all the good stuff. The happy place. And that can, that can still, that can be different, different qualities. That can still be transactional. We can have a building that generates more energy than it needs and it shares it with, its, um, with the charity building next door. Can be, we've got some wastewater that we've treated and we need to get rid of that can flush somebody else's toilets. But in a sense, the bigger opportunity is around how we regenerate the health of the living systems in the places that we live. And, um, and don't get me wrong, we need to be doing the green and the sustainability stuff. That's really important. We shouldn't be wasting energy and stuff. We actually have to get that right. And that buys us a bit of time so that we can work out and start practicing regenerative development. Now, this series is called Regenerative uh, Design. So you are, this is your first step towards becoming regenerative de designers, regenerative product suppliers, and um, starting our, our new process of thinking. And so I'm just going to share a little bit about the Living Building Challenge. Now, in itself, the Living Building Challenge is not a regenerative design outcome, but it is a tool. I call it the gateway drug to regenerative development. It's, it helps us imagine the path to where we need to be. And um, the example I'm going to show you, the, the Naituhoi Takura Fari project, um, Although we weren't driving it, we were the designers of this building, this is my Jazzmax hat. Um, we were the designers of the building and we worked very closely with the contractor and the client to look at all the positive handprint that we could create. It was really the client that had this plan around how they were going to regenerate their people and do that by regenerating the relationship between Naituhoi and Te Rawira as their place. So, the Living Building Challenge, it's, it's you know, compared to uh, Homestar and things like that, it's way out there. It really is a challenge. It forces us to really get into the nitty gritty of um, how we design and build. And it, not just, it doesn't just look at um, energy and water, it actually deals with social justice and equity and beauty as well. So um, the metaphor of a flower, imagine if all our buildings harvested the energy they need from the sky, the water from the sky or the ground, uses no toxic chemicals, part of the integrated web of life, and um, is adapted to the climate and the site that it's situated in and of course is beautiful. So that's the premise of a living building. Um, it started in 2006 in Seattle and it's rapidly spreading around the world. There's a, they opened the Institute in Europe um, late last year. Uh, Australia's going great guns. I don't ha I'm not going to talk about it much today, but there is a two and a half hectare shopping centre just outside Melbourne that is doing full living building challenge compliance. And our mates just across the road, Countdown, are in that shopping centre and they have changed the specification of every standard material that they use. They're even putting doors on their fridges not, not their freezers, they're putting doors on their fridges because that reduces their energy by 80%. They have to be a net zero energy, net zero waste, net zero water supermarket within a wider retail center. And that will be open in December. Where is that? Where is it? Uh, it's just outside Melbourne. It's called the Brickworks Center. And it's part of a Fraser property development. So they're doing lots of housing and this is sitting in the middle of it. It's also got a farm on the roof. And typically, if you said to a shopping, you said to Westfield, I'm going to put a farm on the roof of this shopping centre, and they go, yo, 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 Jerome, get out of here. But in actual fact, this farm takes all the organic waste from the centre, 
It grows food for some of the cafes. It's running education courses and training and gardening and composting. And it increases foot traffic to the retail shopping centre to such an extent that the rents are 10% above their initial um, you know, projection for the return on this. So driving a profit is really important in terms of, they wouldn't, I know I'm teasing you, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be doing it if they weren't making a profit. But they've taken a big, bold, audacious step. So seven petals to living building challenge, place, water, energy, health and happiness, kind of no brainers. A couple of, there are some offsets in there. You have to offset the land that you've used for the building because that building can never have an ecological natural system on it again. Because you put a building on it, yeah? <coughs> um, I'll talk a little bit more about these within the context of the project. Materials, probably the toughest, but a lot easier since we did um, the build, since we designed the building five, six years ago. And people like Bernice and Firth having declare labels means that you can just plug in non-toxic building products to your building now. Um, equity and um, beauty. So I'll just talk about those. So this is, a, this is an image. We actually spent Thursday and Friday there last week. Um, the Living Building Challenge is Two Hoys Building Code now. They do nothing less than that. And um, they have developed this HQ, their offices and meeting space and they built a business hub, they built a health centre and they are just planning their first living village in Tanya to 25 houses and a community house. And beauty is in the eye of beholder, so that's a subjective thing, but I, some people love this building, I do, some people um, don't like it so much, but um, there you go. And what's interesting is that in um, Te Ao Māori, all things have life force. they all all alive. This computer is alive. I'm alive. And so to have a building like this, that is part of, that is obviously a living building once they've designed and built it. Uses some modern technology around this um, multipole system for the piles and for the sh earthquake shear resistance in the building. But predominantly this building is timber because it sequesters carbon and it's local to their land. And they used both their own plantation grown and also native timber species from down and dead logs. So they sent people out into the terroirs, into the forest, to bring these logs in and to mill them for cladding and for joinery and for um, other elements of the building. Um, it is, in a sense, it reflects its place because it is a forest of trees. And for Tuhoi, the t you know, the terroirs, the forests are who they are, it defines them. They don't actually consider themselves Maori. They could just, we're too hoi because we live here in this place. Local materials, non-toxic materials, and especially for them upskilling their people and creating jobs and opportunities and creating new businesses. So making 5,000 earth bricks to be built into the building. And that's part of the air conditioning system, the earth bricks. They suck in moisture, they release it, they uh, thermal mass. And they also have the texture and quality. Every brick is signed by the person who made it. It's got a handprint in. Um, it generates all its own energy. It has a, a, a high-performance solar hot water system that drives the cafe and the showers and the hand wash. And then it has the solar electric panels on the roof. And that provides them with all the energy they need on an annual basis. They also have um, batteries. This building is also, not only is it iconic, not only is it a, uh, the first living building challenge certified project outside of the United States, but it's also their civil defense HQ. It is a place of retreat and resilience in times of emergency. And they have them, you know, the Edgecombe uh, floods, the Edgecombe earthquake in the 80s. So this, this building is, um, it's not a police station, you know, hospital level, but it's the, it's the seismic restraint level below that. Um, has a wetland, it has a traditional septic and a, a botanical wetland and the wetland eats the bacteria at once the water's been semi-treated and the plants eat the nutrients and then that water is pretty much, it's not quite, um, you know, you wouldn't put it into a tap but the guy who builds these systems would drink it at the end of this. This is using nature to purify the water so that it's fit to be put back out into the living system. And um, 
what I would say, one of the, so in terms of regenerative development, this was about growing the awareness of the people, creating jobs, rebuilding people's hope and inspiration, because Tuhoi were broken by colonization and um, they understood that they had some really serious work to do with their people to just wake them up to the potential that they are now in a different space and that they're, they're determining their own future. Who's heard of life cycle analysis? Okay, it's good. So life cycle analysis, LCA, it's one of the tools in the green toolkit bag that allows us to look at the whole picture of the environmental impact of a building or a material. And an EPD, if um, Bernice mentioned EPDs earlier, that's a sort of a snapshot of a building product's life cycle. It looks at what its impacts are to be made and used and what you do with it at the end of its life. But we can do this for buildings as well. And that's required for living buildings because they have to offset the embodied carbon and the operational carbon of a hundred year life. So the embodied carbon is the energy it takes to make the building, all the transport, all the fabrication of the materials, and then the um, operational carbon is replacing the windows in 50 years time and the energy that's used or water. And in Tuhoi's case, they don't have an operational carbon bill for, for water or for energy because they have built their own systems into the building. So it looks at nine environmental indicators, but pretty much conventionally is reduced down to just the carbon impacts. And you can start to see that um, Takura Fari has the lowest embodied and operational carbon of any, this is the lowest um, building in, in New Zealand. There's a typical office up at the 20 kgs, a smaller office, less servicing around the 16. A similar living building challenge building is still at the 13 and Tuhoi is right down there at the 10 kgs level. So this is an exemplar building of how we should be um, creating buildings in New Zealand, sequestering carbon and making them super efficient and um, durable, reducing the maintenance that they need over their lifetime. And I'm just going to point out a bit of a hoary one here. So 400,000 kilos of CO2 to build the thing, nearly a million kilos during its use, it's quite a big bill when we get to demolish it in 100 years' time. That's 300,000 um, kilos. And then there's a little bit of benefit. Because it's been designed to eliminate waste, at the end of its life, the major elements can be reused and repurposed for a new building. You get a little bit of a credit at the end. So total for the two-way building, 1.5 tonnes of CO2. But in actual fact, um, nearly... 30% of that figure is for the replacement of the solar panels on the roof. So solar panels have a high embodied carbon footprint. You have to be careful which, and that's a generic figure, but you have to be, some are made using hydro energy, take about two years to pay off their embodied carbon, and some are made using coal-fired electricity in China, and they can take seven to eight to nine years just to pay off their own carbon. So we have to, dive a bit deeper and be really understanding of what we're deciding to do. So I'm not actually advocating that all buildings should be net zero energy in New Zealand. Some need to be to demonstrate proof of, proof of the pudding, but we just have to make sure we get the right mix, the local appropriate mix for us. George, what a question. Um, I just don't know if the audience is aware there's photo nano paint that's available. So you can take that normal paint that's potentially west side of the building um, and the paint itself generates energy. Mm. Yeah. And that's what is used in the satellites. The satellites are coated with a photo nano um, um, paint, oh. unfortunately it's polymer. Um, and that's what keeps satellites for however many years on end. Yeah. And the technology is just across the ditch, you know it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to play with that art, you can facilitate a research project for you. Cool. So um, what did I talk about? So I think this building's beautiful. Tuhoi tend to paint rather than carve, so that's the big painted panels on the side. And just Thursday, Friday last week, we had a healthy material showcase. We had 30 product stands, 
250 odd people over the two days, two Hoi people looking at their village and then people from, we got people from Topo, Hamilton, uh, Rotorua, Whakatani, Tauranga, all coming to the building and um, having great conversations and learning about what, it, what healthy materials are. So, questions for you in pairs. What are the pressing unsustainability issues we face from our current development models and who or what do they impact? So, in pairs, conversation. Okay, so what, what, sort, of, what sort of things came up? Um, we talked about um, water, water use yep. and, um, and so um, around water quality but also the amount of um, water that's actually used per person, um, water that's wasted, the amount of water that's used to, you know, to make each litre of milk, um, things like that. So, and then how the systems around that. Um, so in our office we've got grass pavers down you know, and um, we're limiting how much of that system is going in to, you know, cause flooding in the river on a king tide. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I think water we take for granted, and you know, other countries it's uh, much more precious. Mm. You know? okay. When we had the earthquake, it became like gold. And yes. We realised, you yeah. know, how much we depend on water. Yeah. Uh, take long to get again. You know, our ten-star <laughs> home, we used the eco paving first um, permeable paving. <laughs> it's a really amazing system, yeah, because it actually cleans, the, the point is it cleans the water before it recharges the aquifer, so we're not putting all the hydrocarbons and nitrates and runoff into, back into the aquifer. It's super easy to collect the rainwater, you know, the, the next stage on from that is grey water recycling. Um, you know, that's a bit of a stretch in Christchurch because it's still free, but, you know, we've got grey water in, in that 10 star home. and. We drink the grey water by choice because it doesn't have chlorine in it. It's, it's, be, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's better. I used to say it's as good as Christchurch, it's beautiful clean water, but it's actually better because it doesn't have the chlorine in it. There you go. What other things came up for people? Uh, I sort of raised, I raised quite the issue around so the scale. I mean, you mentioned it before, but coming from Europe and then coming to New Zealand, the size of buildings and you can yeah. make those buildings out of sustainable materials you can make it zero energy but fundamentally you are using more materials than you actually really need to you can think smart and make a fantastic home and at some of the super homes I've seen I think there was a uh, three bed that was like 125 meters square with a carport outside that I remember at in yeah Brighton this, this year's tour we had a 70 know. square meter home and um, you know right up to a three 60, I think, so yeah, quite a range and, and different things. And, but size is really important. Yeah. And it's a really easy one, just, yeah. you know. And then that addresses so the affordability side and you can put more into the quality. And I mean, just, yeah, it was absolutely. mentioned before, but to me, that's, you know, it's just an absolute no-brainer. It also leaves more space outside to be putting nature yeah. in, you know, you can retain your, your native shrubs yeah. and plants and your English roses and whatever else you want, but you know, you've got some green space, which is good for your mental health as well. Yeah, it's completely bonkers that um, you know, we've got a housing crisis and we're building to ex access lots of four or five bedroom houses that have a couple of entry empty rooms in them except for one week of the year when people come to stay. Um, and they've maxed out their sections, so all around the perimeter of those houses are these nasty little spaces where you're looking at a fence. Yeah. So that indoor-outdoor connection that you could be enjoying that's compromised because you've got a big footprint. It's just not the key we And it sheds lots of water. I mean, that has a huge impact again on that water flushing off into our waterways, which is an unnatural sort of system and that impacts on the ecology, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So just sort of bringing that back to that whole affordability piece, you know, um, if we just build um, the right type of buildings and not build to excess, then we can afford to do this stuff and it doesn't cost more. But, um, it's a mental shift um, and it, we, we have to get people somehow, because it's the clients that are generally driving this. And so I think when I, I was thinking about the profit thing that I raised before, and it's you know the difficulty you have as architects is you're having to work with clients who have got their own particular perspective and mindset. And if you have someone who comes to you who's already sustainable, great, you can work together. But how do you work with the developer who's looking to build something, sell it on immediately, isn't interested in its long-term cost yeah. per year because, it, you know, and people don't seem to be aware of the fact that, um, you know, that 
the, the cost in the marketing, the market prices don't seem to reflect the lower cost of running. Is the impression that I get, and so there's really nothing to drive. You know, there's a yes, quick, yes and no. Um, and you know, we did um, two homes. We sold one. Both were ten stars. The the single story one sold for twenty nine percent more than a code minimum home would have sold for. Um, so. There are a small number of people that recognise the, the value, and so you're improving the, the equity and the, the quality of the equity as well. The trick is to get smarter about the engagement with your clients as well. They respond to wellness and healthy. That's exactly what Bob was saying about protecting your family. When you have that conversation from that perspective, people were like, of course, that's, I've got to have that. And then you say, well, the way we do this is by A, B, C, D. And how do you do it commercial or the com even some second? Well, that's actually a big driver in the commercial world because staff retention and looking after your staff is massive. And I'd use the NZI building in Auckland as an example of that. That is a five green star building, but way better than that as well. And um, they've tuned that building up. It's got displacement floor ventilation and thermal mass exposed. And the tenants just, NZI, the tenants love it. They do not want to move. And they work very closely with the landlord to keep that energy bill down. And um, because people love being in the building, they want to stick at their job, etc., etc. That's only some of the story. I won't be interviewed. Can we yeah. just hear from like the row behind you? What do you think sustainability issues, unsustainability issues are? Any thoughts? It's a short-term view of most commercial developers. And so it's all about immediate profit. There's yep. nothing about longevity of the project or sustainability. Or anything so like it's that. a real so challenge. Well, and then you've got product suppliers who are basically in bed with the developer, so you've got no chance of influencing what products go into the building. So that's a, a big issue. Yeah. Anybody else? There's also a pattern that they go over half the planet is under the age of 27 and they don't want to move out into sporting neighbourhoods. Um, my brother's a classic example, he's 20 years, he was 25 when he started the project, he's now 30. He was going to go and buy an intricate mansion out in the suburbs and the fringes of you know, suburbia. He decided to spend more money on the plot of land close to town and build a terrace. It's still 288 square metres, but it's off the grid. There's less elaborate walling system, it's just a terrace. Mm -hmm. He's foregoing east and west sunlight, but he's building into it still a lovely contemporary, you know, basement and you know, butler kitchens and whatever the fancy stuff is, but it's off the grid and it's contained, um, as opposed to all well, these windows out in the east wing and upstairs and um, so they're making your next generation of consumers who are gonna buy your design services are already making those decisions. I've noticed the same in the other end of the spectrum. So I've got a client who, um, they're wealthy, and they've spent their whole lives living in a New Zealand nice big old wooden house on Kashmir Hills. And they've always been freezing cold. And their number one requirement is, it has to be warm. That they're, they're retiring, and they're putting, they're sinking a lot of money into this. They went to Sweden recently because one of their kids moved over there and it's very cold in Sweden. It's like minus 40 degrees in winter. It's triple freezing. The whole house is warm and they're saying, right, okay, we want to experience this in our, in our retirement. We don't want to have to live in a cold house. Tell us how to do that. So they're really interested in better systems because they're at the other end of um, their lives and they're thinking, right. Now I've got this let's, let's do it this week. Um, so, so what did we have? We've got um, our, our investments are actually appalling investments. The effort to uh, buy the land, design, um, coordinate with all the consultants, the engineering, and then the you know the contractor to build it. This is a like a thermographic image of a block of flats. And you can see the dark patches are where the insulation is installed. The light patches are where the, the framing is coming right through or the insulation is missing. And um, it's just leaking energy. And as on the inside, with cold spat, spots, that's where, you know, especially at the bottom of walls with downdrafts, that's where you get mold growing and condensation. And typically, this building's rotting away. You know, it's got one layer of fibre cement on it. 
And then, so we demolish them, chuck it all into the skip, chuck it into a hole in the ground. All those resources wasted. And you can see there's a whole, there's even brand new kit there, ducts and there's electrical with copper in and cardboard that could be recycled. But the key thing about this is that the guys who are doing the demolition, the last thing they do, they need the light until they finish. So the last thing they do is take out the fluoro tubes, chuck them on the skip, and they have mercury vapor inside them. And mercury is a liquid, heavy metal, that um, we can inhale and absorb through our skin. It perforates the liver, perforates the kidneys, and causes really nasty long-term health impacts. So they chuck the fluorescent tubes on the top, the vapor escapes, the truck drives down the road, leaking mercury vapor, which settles on the ground. So every time a car drives past, phew, stirs it up. And who, who gets it? Dogs, because they're down there. And of course, babies in prams, because they're right there at ground level. And then a little bit for us. So we just spread, that's just one toxic metal amongst hundreds of chemicals that we leach out into our ecosystem and expose ourselves to. And the result of that, for instance, is male fertility has dropped by 50% in OECD countries in the last 30 years. That is really significant. It's these toxic chemicals, and it's also a mixture of things like the, you know, the, the um, pill, which is a female hormone mimicker. And a lot of the plasticizers in plastic are also very similar. They mimic female hormones. So we've basically filled up our water system with, with crap. Um, increased whale strandings, collapse of insect populations, inappropriate land development. You know, all those houses built around the exterior of uh, Christchurch after the quake has just solidified that you are a car city. And it's a really difficult, that is a multiple generation challenge to, to shift that. Ocean acidification as a result of climate change. Red bill gulls. Who goes to the beach and sees red bill gulls on the beach at Christmas time? They look like they're everywhere, don't they? Because they like, they like hanging out on the beach. The same number of red bill gulls in New Zealand as there are kiwis. They are a really severely endangered species. So all these things are going on. All the, you know, we're talking about health of our families and how we build, but at the same time, the impacts of this go really wide and big. And then we have, you know, then we just start thinking about the food system and deforestation for growing palm, palm oil. So just on waste, waste is something that's actually not that difficult to deal with, you know, and um, about half of waste going to landfill is construction waste. And, um, you know, five tonnes of waste for every home that's produced. But, um, you know, to be a 10 star home, you're only allowed 10 kilograms per square metre of waste and um, you've just got to sort everything at the source and you've just got to have the conversation with people at the start of the project. There's no skip on the site so you can't just biff everything in the skip. It, it's more than that though as well it, because well, if you make the building out of materials that you can't recycle at the end, so if you glue the jib board to the wall, I know it's part of the system. Yeah. yeah. The, the best way to, to avoid yeah. waste is to design it out. Yeah, it's so prefabricated. Screw things off, um, bolt things together. Yeah, and um, everything that you throw away has been purchased in the first place. Exactly. It costs money to throw that stuff and away. Carbon. Yeah. In like those houses we've built in the last 30 years that have, they're different to the, the sort of state homes that are made out of timber and mm. you know, they're now you can pop them, pop them apart. Yeah. They didn't have jibboard, they didn't have you know, all these glues and fancy materials that can't be recycled. So yeah. our problem is actually going to get worse if we don't change it now. Yeah, I think it's an easy, it's low hanging fruit to deal with the yeah. waste. Yeah. yeah, it is easy. No yeah. skip. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Climate change impacts, they're here, they're happening right now, and they're starting to really cause trouble, let alone the bigger ones. If you think like 200 million people live in the Bay of Bengal, that's Bangladesh, um, West India, bits, bits of um, or a few other countries around that bay, they're all living pretty much. The, the reason they're there is because it's a river delta and the soil's really fertile, but they're also at sea level. And so, the sea levels are rising. Where are they all going to go? So, just quick question, just not too long on this. Really hone into the barriers, the, the, the things that are stopping you thinking like this. 
behaving like this, working with your clients. You start, a few people started to talk about the challenges. But just make some notes about what are the barriers that stop you uh, engaging with your clients or counsel or whatever. Just give you two minutes. And then Bob's going to do a little bit of an overview of the tools and their value to us. And um, should we, when do we do morning tea? Should we do morning tea after this? Session? Yeah, OK, after this little bit here, yeah. OK, so we'll have a quick break for morning tea and um, visiting the toilets just after you finish this bit. I kind of became the poster boy for Homestar when we did that, that home. Um, it's, it's a great thing. There's a lot of important um, categories and, and attributes that it advocates for. But unfortunately, there's been very little uptake with Homestar. And um, so I love all the thinking and all the ideas, but it's not really delivering in terms of outreach and uh, impact. Um, but so I'm going to just quickly go over, you know, we, we probably all know that building code sits around about here, three, three to four stars, and it's not good enough. Um, various councils, Auckland Unitary Plan, they tried to introduce six. It wasn't ratified, so it got kicked out. Same in Christchurch. Um, Jerry Brownlee said, no, you can't have home star six. It's got to be three. So still Christchurch City Council, they're tasked with confirming that everything you put in for a consent complies with three-star building code. We think it should be around about here, you know, for, particularly for Christchurch climate, seven or above. And, um, yeah, um, the building code, you know, I say it's the worst possible building that you're legally allowed to build, but um, we use that as a target, or well, the industry uses that as a target. If you look at brands research, um, over 95% of buildings are just built to code. And that's a real problem. Um, and, you know, code obviously doesn't e equal quality and it's actually not fit for purpose. So, sorry Bernadette, I've stolen one of your slides here. And I've, I've butchered it and added some bits to it. But Bernadette did some great research on rating tools and looked at the different attributes of each of the rating tools. Can you read that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got a bit shonky at the end <coughs> when I copied it onto Jerome's computer. But um, yeah, so I just, I think this is great because it just really graphically illustrates um, what are the, the different categories and um, elements to the rating, various rating tools. So. You know, LEED, that's American one. It's a little bit like Homestar, but um, probably Homestar's modelled on that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Passive House, it's a super great standard for energy and air tightness. And, you know, it's all about physics and building science, and I love it. But um, it's just about those things, and there's a whole lot of other stuff to think about as well. Living Building Challenge is just the best. It looks at everything. And some of the things that it looks at are, are wonderful, like, you know, Beauty and spirit, equity, bi biophilic environment, health and happiness. Um, super home movement, we're trying to be holistic and look at everything, but we're also bringing into it resilience and longevity. You know, in the media a couple of weeks ago, there was a thing about um, cladding materials only have to last for 15 years. Windows, 15 years. Yeah. How ridiculous that's is that? The, that's the, that's the, the yeah. amended amazingness. Yeah, and your whole building, 50 years. So I think a building should last for 100 years or 200 years. Um, you know, I'm living in a 1906 <coughs> villa. We've actually forgotten how to do it. We used to build with really um, resilient, durable native timbers, and now we've, we've kind of gone backwards. Um, so validation and monitoring, I really think that all of the, a lot of the, the rating tools and certifications, they're looking at a modelled performance, predicted performance of a proposed design. And the proof is in the pudding. We should be sort of monitoring and um, checking. Has it actually been built to what was proposed? And uh, I think that's the way of the future. And um, my vision is I'd like to see every super home with monitoring, and it's becoming much more affordable and easier to do that. So, you know. I've got 
to talk to you about that. So I want to say that now because we have some really good gadgets that we've just developed and I want to put it into the research proposal. So can you yep. talk to me? Awesome. Right? Got the gadgets. Yeah. Get the houses. Yeah. Yeah, so the sensors are quite cheap, and then how you link that to a wireless modem, and and, um, and then. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing is knowing about what's happening in your house, and then taking making the interventions to um, fix it. Sorry, Mitchell. Oh, when you say the sensors are quite cheap, do you have because I can't find anything that has any sort of CO two. Yeah. So we've tried to develop a sensor that was going to provide us with a meaningful, um, and I think we've, we've built something in our in our, our, our yeah. that we yeah. want to use as a research project tool. Yeah. Because yeah. that was one of the issues. Yeah, I found it really hard to find any sort of good sensor. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. Um, so, uh, you know, EPCs. Um, oh, just before I get into that, you know, this idea of everything's free. With, with super homes, we're talking about just open source sharing information. It's too important to sort of hold on to trade secrets. And you know, in the industry, we've got this sort of um, this status quo is this sort of attitude of um, sort of professional rivalry and one-upmanship. But you know, I think I just give away all my ideas because I think I'm on this journey of continual improvement. So the next job I do, I've learned something. It's going to be better. I'm moving on. Um, and we really are at the start with this stuff. We've got a long way to go. Um, so, um, and just, we've been quite good at collaborating with local government. Christchurch City Council are a great council. Um, we've, we've just said we're not going to wait for the building code to change. We're going to do things from the ground up. And, um, you know, more recently we've started um, knocking on the door of central government, but they're not listening yet. But we'll keep trying because it's too important to stop. Um. I'll just add, basically, from today, walking out of here, you really, you know, if we, we have roughly 10 years to make, an, make it, you know, our contribution to making a dent on the climate change crisis. And although I don't want to isolate one problem without considering the others, it does need a particular attention. Mm. And you can do that through really good design of the buildings, making them smaller, reducing their footprint, growing their, how they share, their not, the buildings and the communities share their knowledge, and um, re reducing your carbon through good design, thermal mass, great insulation, air tightness, etc. And at least focus on the buildings that you're designing so that they are the best they possibly can be. And have those dialogues with your clients. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we need to think about what's our personal code. You know, what's our code of conduct? And um, you know, this is a this is a great book that I came across, the Carbon Code. Um, and it's really, you know, individually we can do a lot. Um, another thing which I came across was, um, you know, the A, D, and Z. We've got a code of ethics. We've got competency standards. And um, 1.4 sustainable design. Um, you know, it talks about environmental, social responsibility of the building industry, and um, and uh, you know further on it talks about um, the the being able to the built environment and services to comply with principles, social, economic, and ecological sustainability to acceptable levels as established from time to time. So, what about this time? You know, we're at a. I think we're at a um, crucial time where, you know, as Jerome said, we could be reaching a tipping point, and you know, we could look back on this time and say, well, this is the time that we did something. And um, you know, I'll pass this around. You know, from time to time isn't good enough. It's like you know, and acceptable levels. What is that? It's like we need to say what is the level and. Um, you know, looking at rating tools, it puts some parameters around that, some metrics around that, but it's too expensive and it's too difficult. So I think what we probably need is something like what they have in the UK, which is EPCs, Energy Performance Certificates. Um, 
and um, you know it costs a hundred pounds to, to get a performance certificate and it tells you how much does it cost to run your home um, you know we know we have that for appliances we have that for cars why don't we have that for, for houses mm. that, that applies for both um, private your own sort of buying and selling houses, but yeah, also for absolutely. rentals as well. So as a renter, you can look and see what you're letting yourself in for. Yeah, so isn't the government doing a rental wharf or something like that? Or is it so a time boy? No, only one person took it up, I think. Uh, Wellington tried that and failed. Um, and, uh, you know, we have the new Healthy Homes Act, but um, it's just too little, too late, and it's, um, it's got loopholes that you could drive a truck through, so it's got no teeth. Um, but yeah, I think this idea of a simple energy rating uh, would go a long way, and um, you know, I'll just keep moving, but um, you know, I went to uh, UK and Europe late last year, and I saw this in practice, um, and you know, I can, sh I'm just trying to speed up a little bit, but I can share these slides um, and uh, yeah, so there's an example of an energy performance um, certificate from Scotland, actually. That one. That's right. They have them yeah. in Scotland because they're yeah. that's a European system. They're building energy rating birth certificates. You can't buy or sell a house or rent a house without disclosing that information. Yeah. So it just just becomes part of the conversation about yeah. the yeah. evaluating yeah. the house. A-rated Yeah, so this was a photo of, it just looked like a house in um, this tiny little village in France, but quite prominently you've got the energy rating and it affects the sale price of the... Um, How's it really the um, Is it by monitoring the house or by looking at the build-up of the wall and yeah. with some assumptions? Uh, there won't be any monitoring, it's just there'll be um, an assessment... A, yeah, a, a software ass assessment. Someone will visit the house and, and do a... Um, but, uh, yeah, so th this is the thing that we use for monitoring at um, our 10-star home. It's quite, it's, you know, it's not cheap, but it, it's really sophisticated and it, it kind of, I can look at it on my phone, it links to an app and it monitors all sorts of stuff. Um, Temperature, humidity, CO2, um, air pressure, VOCs, um, nitrogen, ozone, all sorts of stuff. And um, so that's um, it's about $300. Um, so actually, shall I just pass this, um, this around? I mean, you guys should have like read this and memorised it anyway. The, um, <laughs> The ADNZ competency standards, but I'll pass that around because it's just... Oh, sorry. <coughs> Kicking the microphone. In, you mentioned the eth code of ethics. Is there something in there about environment, your sort of environmental, um, the ethically, ethically what, what... Yeah, is, so what the, there's the, a whole page there. That, that's the yeah. competencies, but actually within the, ethic, the code of ethics as well, is there something in that? Okay. I, I think there should be, but there isn't. So there's no, the, there isn't on the NZIA. There's the code of ethics. So, so slightly more than the NZIA's got. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so they have almost nothing. The British and the Australian architects are very much stronger. Yeah. So you know the Royal uh, Institute of British Architects. A couple of weeks ago, they declared a climate emergency, like a lot of people have, and um, they basically drew a line in the sand and said, or put a stake in the ground and said. You cannot enter our architectural awards if you don't meet certain sustainability criteria. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah. I was on the awards panel a few years ago for the NZIA here, and it wasn't. I was the only person bringing it up, and it wasn't actually criteria, criteria. Yeah. And um, some people like Simon Alfie, he had a house that had performed beautifully, but I really feel that the NZIA need to take this more seriously. Much, much more seriously. Yeah. We should be leading in this area. Yeah, so I think, you know, it's a few years ago now, but I was in this very room and there was an, an architect, um, I think his name was James Timberlake. He came over here as a judge for the awards, for the NZIA awards. And he didn't pull any punches. He stood here and he talked to a whole room full of architects. And he said, these are all beautiful homes and um, I'm really impressed, but they're appalling in terms of their sustainability credentials. 
and you know, similar in the house of the year, master builders. You look at some of these homes, it's a beauty contest, and they're just gas guzzling, you know, monstrosities. I just want to repeat again how important it is to have this conversation first, because mm. it's the well that drives it. Energy efficiency and stuff, yeah, a few niche nerds like that kind of thing, like me and Bob and stuff, but well being, health, looking after my family, actually, that opportunity to look, you know, play our role in the bigger sustainability debate. Have that conversation first, and then the rest will flow much more easily and naturally from that. Just, um, yeah, also just to add to that, that um, if you get buy in at that level from your clients, you get buy in from then on for the whole project, they'll back you the whole way. Yeah, yeah. it's really important. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, just thinking about this stuff, um, it's useful to look at what happens in other parts of the planet. Yeah. And um, so we're not on our own, even though we're like at the bottom of the world. Um, so, you know, there's London's um, Mayor Sadiq Khan, he said, he's pledged 500 million pounds for um, uh, retrofitting build, uh, homes and office buildings to be more energy efficient. Um, New York's mayor, um, Bill de Blasio, he's come out and said, um, we're not having full glass buildings in New York City. Um, so there's some parts of the planet, Japan, you know, um, they've got a history of doing kind of it's, it's quite odd, but they, they, their buildings have a shelf life of about 30 years. Um, and, you know, I've, I've spent a bit of time in Japan, but last time I was there, I was really surprised to see how much things had changed. They weren't actually that good sort of 20 years ago um, or even 10 years ago. But they're a clever bunch and they're really good at rapid change. So, you know, Sekisui House, the biggest house builder in Japan, they now build, everything's triple glazed, um, and 75% of what they do is zero energy. It wasn't like that sort of three or four years ago. And um, I think, you know, they had a moment where, I mean, when we had a big earthquake in Christchurch, a week after, if you remember, they had a massive earthquake and there was a big tsunami, and, um, you know, it took out their nuclear power station. And my, um, I think uh, my view is maybe they woke up to the, the fact that energy supply was an issue for them and they decided let's just build to be more energy efficient in the first place so we don't need to worry about as much energy supply. So, you know, I'll be keeping an eye on what's happening in Japan. Um, so, um, morning tea. Morning tea. Woo! Okay, so you can see, remember I introduced the idea of footprint and handprint at the beginning? And the footprint is typically all the bad stuff we do and we try and minimize it, offset, and handprint is all the good stuff we can do. So me and Bob, we've been moving back and forwards between the two. Um, I'm just gonna do a little bit of footprinting. Um, I just want to, this is one place where you as designers um, can start making an instant difference in uh, how you approach and how we support not just your clients through designing healthier homes, but also work, contribute towards the transformation of the whole industry. So in the Living Building Challenge, materials is one of the toughest, is one of the toughest petals. And there is um, a general approach to being responsible about materials. Then there's something called the red list, which are the worst in class toxic chemicals, um, where your um, materials are coming from. On Tuhoi, 70% of the spend was spent within a 100 kilometer radius of the site. That's materials, labor, and, um, and local contractors. Um, that you're helping generate a local economy. And net positive waste is basically about planning to get, eliminate waste to landfill in the design stage, the construction stage, the operation stage, and the demolition stage. But I just want to talk a little bit about the red list. Um, this is California Country Club, the beach, 1960s. Go to the beach, the last thing you want is an annoying fly while you're lying there sunbathing and relaxing. So what do you do? 
You spray the bejesus out of it with uh, DDT, one of the most toxic carcinogenic chemicals known to humankind, and make sure you get the little kids who are, are naked, you know, running around um, in their birthday suits. So we used to think this was a great idea. This was just following the Second World War, the whole industrial um, complex was like, what do we do? We were making thousands of tanks and planes and ammunition, so they got into making industrial fertilizer and industrial chemicals. And they just like, yeah, I was solving all these um, first world problems without realizing that there were really serious consequences. So typically we might think, find things like volatile organic compounds and they're found in, they're sort of, they evaporate and they help glues and adhesives and paints to set, um, glues in furniture and stuff like that and carpet and typically they cause headaches, memory impairment, respiratory allergic immune impairments in children. We have formaldehyde, very common in the wood industry in terms of glues and um, resins and coatings and also in paints and textiles. It doesn't do, do you any good whatsoever. It causes skin rashes. When we were doing the two hoy building, there was a little, a little local business that made these things called spacemen. Bernice will know what this is. Spacemen is these funny shaped little things and they are used to um, support the, the steel mesh and concrete and just keep it away from the edge so that it doesn't corrode and rust. And so the materials researcher had this conversation with the company, we wanted to use them, they were local to Fakatani, and it all sounded good, made in silicon molds and he's like, yeah, yeah, it's just concrete in there and blah, blah, blah. And then just, they were just winding up the conversation and somehow it slipped out that they, um, had a big bucket of um, formaldehyde and they just get a brush and paint the inside of the mold with formaldehyde as a sort of release agent. So you can imagine, Fukutani, were they wearing masks? Were they wearing gloves? Probably not. And, um, and so the alarm bells went up and she just said, you, you know, you know, it's really toxic and it's like in contact with your skin, it causes all sorts of problems. And the guy was like, oh, oh, oh. turns out they didn't even really need to use it. The molds are flexible anyway. We just thought that was part of the process. So that was an instant win. He stopped using formaldehyde to make these spacemen. PVC. Why is PVC so cheap and endemic? Because when you take crude oil and you distill it into petrol and diesel and light oils, the crud you get left at the end is what they make PVC out of. It's basically a waste product. And then they add all sorts of dodgy chemicals to make it hard, temperature proof, elastic, whatever you want. And it's those chemicals that are really, really dangerous. And the challenge, one of the biggest challenges is when we have house fires or buildings burn, that PVC gets burnt and produces dioxins, which just go out and it's carcinogenic. And um, in actual fact, it was the fire brigade in the UK that basically said, if you don't retrofit all your institutional buildings, that's universities, uh, libraries, uh, civic buildings, art galleries, airports, we, if you haven't retrofitted within a certain time, we will not come and fight the fires in those buildings because continuous exposure to dioxins from the burning of PVC, basically putting the fire brigade at risk. So it's banned in all institutional buildings in the UK. And well, I mean, you think it can be used for flooring, for windows, for guttering, for just thousands of things. So they basically, you have to find substitutes for it. P, P, uh, HDPE is commonly, you know, that's a very simple plastic, eminently recyclable and commonly used for replacement of say pipe, drainage pipe and stuff like that. Um, a lot of carpet tile manufacturers do not use PVC for the backing now, they have alternatives. So there's lots of alternatives out there. It's just, I'm raising your awareness of this. Um, a lot of these chemicals, um, they are fatty soluble. So for mammals, they go through the food chain. They get, first of all, they get into the air through fires and through skips and construction release, and they get into the waterways and then they build up through the food chain. Bacteria absorb them, the fish eat the bacteria, we eat the fish. So it goes on um, right up to uh, orcas and humans. And it's quite challenging because the 23 chemicals on the red list translate into 800 compounds. And so what do we do about that? Well, we need, just like we like to know what's in our food, we need to know what's in our building products. 
And um, so what if we had a declare label that told us the ingredients in our building products? And a little bit more than that, they tell us where the product's made so we can see if they're local products. We can see what they're made out of, the ingredients, and if there are any issues. Um, some of those chemicals don't have replacements yet, so there are some exceptions that are allowed into a declare label and um, allow, make them uh, applicable to a living building challenge project. And, um, but there is pressure on those manufacturers to find alternate, safe alternatives. And it also tells you what to do with the product at the end of its life. So what do you, how do you dispose of it? So where it's made, what its end of life options are, what are the ingredients, there's some rules around that, and um, VOC testing if it's an interior product. So basically you can start tomorrow, you can start, there are 80 declare labels in New Zealand that are New Zealand manufacturers. There's quite a few more from Australia, and there's also some international products that have declare labels that are imported to New Zealand by people like Foreman's, for instance. So you could be using 10% of your specification could be declare products tomorrow. You just have to go on the declare website, put in New Zealand as the search function, then Australia, and then whatever else you need and start changing your specifications and use declare products. And Bernice has pointed out that um, a whole range of um, concrete blocks, paving, and um, the concrete all have declare labels produced by then. So easy. So I wanted to, okay, so that's footprint. We're just gonna do some handprints and regenerate. <clears throat> Operate, improve the function and reduce the impact. So maintain means to allow that operation to carry on. To improve means that you're actually getting the system to work better. You're maybe creating more energy than you need or more water than you need or whatever. Regenerate means to continually bring forward the essence of the place, the people, the living system that we're working with in new ways and in new contexts. Regeneration actually means to evolve ourselves. And it fits very nicely with um, kaitiakitanga which I translate as stewardship. When people are managing the living system in a way to make it more resilient, more abundant, more flourishing, more healthy. And buildings, homes, school buildings, whatever, are really good. They can be acupuncture points. They can be leverage points to help us think about the health of the overall system. And it's through the relationships, it's through the conversations we have that we can leverage that gain and leverage that health and well-being. And I'll give you an example. That when we did Tuhoi, those 750 materials that we spent a day, day and a half, two days on each, asking people to complete the form and telling them why we needed them to declare what was in the product and that we were trying to make a non-toxic building, that sent a pulse of awareness through the material manufacturers in New Zealand. And it's really powerful and it carries on today. With, we've got a huge amount of declare labels. We've got a huge amount of engagement from the material product manufacturers because they don't want to be selling you products that have toxic chemicals in. They want to sell you products that can be recycled at the end of life. They want you to use local products because that supports the local economy. So from doing that one project, we created that that leverage and that pulse of awareness that is changing the whole industry in New Zealand. That is leveraging a project for transformational change. Okay. So I've just got a few more slides. I'm not quite sure I got into the space, but anyway, um, <clears throat> when we talk about, this goes right to the heart of your first question. What's your name? Vicky. Vicky. Hi, Vicky. When we, when we, are trying to be regenerative, we need to create value across the whole system equally, or not necessarily equally, but in some form or another. And this, this, these are the five capitals which kind of underpin the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, actually very similar to the New Zealand government's wellbeing budget this year. And we're all very familiar with infrastructure. You know, we do that all the time. Buildings, transport, utilities. Okay, we know what its value is. We're also very good at um, 
stimulating the economic drivers, you know, the profit. And it's an important part of the ability of this, our system to regenerate. But there's three other elements. One is the human development. That is the personal. That's what we're working on today. We're educating and involving and helping you develop. The other one is the social, and that's what I was referring to earlier. How do we work better together? Our governance, our direction as communities or as a nation. That's a really important area that needs to be worked on. And when you don't work on it, or where you have the Trumps and the Boris Johnsons who undermine it, we end up going into chaos and, and really horrific times. And the fifth one, wrong word, environment, ecology, is the, the, the actual living system or nature. And so the, the challenge to you is that when you're designing a house or you're working on the quality of the relationship with your client, that you're, you use this as a map. How am I going to use this project to create value in all those five capitals? That's the challenge. I need to, yeah, I've got to build a building. Yeah, I've got to make some money and make sure my business is profitable. But how does it impact? You know, here's Bob sending letters off to government. Sort yourselves out. Growing ourselves, what challenges are we engaging with to develop ourselves and our own thinking? And then how is my project going to improve the health of the living system? And that's the thing, that's the thing that we just simply ignore all the time. And that is why our living world is in such appalling condition. And if we don't have a healthy living world, it's game over. So, um, but you're just going to get out of here and see. I need to check the slides and we need to do a time check. Yeah, I'm going to finish off with, um, okay, so I'm going to do two more slides. Then Bob's going to talk to you for a bit. And then the last 15 minutes, we're going to work on your purpose statements, your individual purpose statements. And it can be for yourself, like your business, or it can be for a project that you're working on, okay? So I've just got just two more to do. So this is, a, this is one of the, another of the frameworks from um, regenerative development. This is a, regenerative development is actually a practice. It's like yoga. You have to get up and you have to do a little bit every day. And the more you do, the more muscle you build, training your brain to think in a different way. And it is an evolution because it's, it moves us from the noun, the transaction, the ownership world into the world of relationships and how do we have value-adding relationships between each other, between us and our clients, between us and nature. That's at the heart of it. And so we say when we're being regenerative, we have to do a minimum, a minimum of three lines of work. We've got to be working on ourselves, uh, understanding our ability to think differently, to challenge ourselves. And look, one of the reasons I'm here is I seem to have some capacity for just, um, you know, I, I learn something and I'm like, oh, I really want to try that out. So I'll step out in front of a group of people <laughs> and give it a go. That's one of my qualities. And um, I'm, I, I feel like that's a blessing, you know, that I can do that because it means I can help you experience that and you to grow. The second one is how do we work better together? How do we, this is, the, this is an ADNZ. You're all members of the ADNZ club. How do we work with ADNZ and each other and the Bobs, who are your leaders in that specific area, and lift the game. And the third one is, what, what do you as a group meaningfully contribute to the greater whole? What are you doing for nature? What are you doing for society? What are you doing for governance? It's a really important. You can do more than three lines. <laughs> you can do four or five. And some of the two hoy things, I'll just give you a little story of two hoy. Tower is a weed in the Te Arawiras. They don't want it there. It's been creeping in. So essentially, they got their people to go in to cut down the tower, experience, learn about weeding the Te Arawiras, and then they put them onto the portable mills and they sawed it all up and it became the flooring in the, in the, in the building. And I think that's three or four levels of work. Like they're weeding, they're creating jobs, they're actually using it to build the building and they're telling an amazing story about getting their, their system healthy again. So, I'm just gonna give, this is such a good case study. Bill might have shared this with you in the Auckland conversation. So Bill Reed, this is his project, um, gets invited in to design a green um, sort of food co-op store. And um, 
obviously he's an architect, he quite likes projects, but they go visit the store and in that store are avocados from Mexico, tofu from Burma, grapes from Chile, apples from New Zealand. The very premise, the very purpose of the store is not even green or sustainable. So they're like, uh-huh, okay, what's going on here? And they started looking around and of course it's a river delta, fertile land, it's where people settle because you can grow good crops. And then over time, I can concrete over the backyard, put a little sleep out, densify the city, We've got supermarkets, we don't need to grow any food anymore. So we fill in, we build over the most fertile land and the food is grown further and further out in farms and things like that. But over time, the farmers have got old, they've used pesticides, they've used fertilizer, the farmland is really degraded and not productive and the farmers are old and the land's expensive, they can't sell it on to young farmers. So it's like, this is a real paradox, it's really stuck. So Bill writes the Food Co-op a report saying, you need, it's not so much the focus on a green star food store, you need to regenerate the agricultural system in your, and that's got some challenges and some barriers, and so how do you engage with that? So he loves to tell the story, you're fired. We wanted a green grocery store telling us to go, oh, they couldn't handle it. Got fired, 12 months later, gets the call. We've read your report, makes total sense, Bill. Of course, we, if we really want to be a player in our community, we need to work out how to stimulate the, the farming system so that we can grow local food and we can be sufficient and nutritious and know where our food's coming from, that it's grown healthily, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they set about working on... Um, working on the system, the farming system. And actually they did build a green, you know, superstore, but it was quite different to the original brief. It actually had a farmer's market on the ground floor where people brought the produce. It had a home kill sort of place where the hunters could bring in the wild meat and process it into sausages and steaks and whatever. It had a kindergarten, it had some apartments. So it was still a building project, but the building project was used to leverage a change in the whole system and the whole community. So, I'm gonna hand over to Bob, and he's gonna take you on a little bit of a journey around some of the thinking that he's done around community and bigger scale projects. And then we're gonna save, um, oh, we've got an hour left, we should be good. We're gonna save 15, 20 minutes at the end and do some purposefulness with you. Okay. So in a few weeks time, 5th, 6th of September, at our, with Bernadette and myself, there's a two-day course called Creating Living Buildings. And it's a little bit more organized than this, but it's essentially an, in, an introduction, a, a more formal introduction to regenerative development thinking, then into the Living Building Challenge, and a little bit of process, what we call integrative design training. So it's a great course. It's for designers, um, for specifiers, consultants, building product. Bernice has been on the course in Auckland before, and um, ADNZ people for clients, and also community people, governance people. And like, we're going to try and get George, the sustainability lead, from our, onto the course. So it's really interesting. Two days, dialogue, learning, development, and um, how a lot of living buildings come out of that course. So, hmm. Cool. Over to you, Bob. So, Thank um, you. Who went to Bill Reed's talk? So, cool guy, eh? So, um, um, he's a real visionary and he's really, um, he's a really good talker. He's really inspirational and um, hugely optimistic. So he talked about, you know, we can solve climate change in 18 months if we all work together and, um, you know, um, and uh, yeah, so I learned a lot, you know, and uh, it's, and, um, yeah, um, <laughs> Jerome's already talked about this, but this was one of the, I, I got the opportunity to, um, actually, if you didn't go, so there's only a couple of people that did, then it, if I share this slide, if you just click on this slide, you can see the video, hour long video of his talk, um, it's on YouTube. So um, some of these slides will have video links where you can go to things, and that would be a really good one to, to catch up on. And you know, I got the opportunity to go to the Warren and Marnie breakfast the next day, and um, this is one of the slides that 
he put up, and Jerome's already talked about this, <clears throat> but this is an exercise that he put up to, to for, for people to do. So, um, and uh, I also got the chance to go to a, di a potluck dinner and ha have a chat to Bill afterwards. Um, and so maybe, um, and I had, had a talk to him about a potential project coming up to do a new mosque for Christchurch. And this, um, when this exercise came up, the project that I thought about was that project and just sort of widening my thinking. And it's, it's probably ch gonna change the way I think about design, really. So maybe this is a good one just to do this little exercise before I carry on and have a think about a project and have a chat to whoever you're sitting next to. Um, but uh, yeah, and just think about the context and the this sort of stuff, um, starting from the top instead of starting from design. And um, just, yeah, if you've got a project or even a past project, just have a chat and then... Um, we'll Save this regenerative moment, a bit of yeah. And that idea that we could fix climate change in 80 months is pretty cool. So, yeah, as Bob says, just any project that you're working on, it can be an old project, a new project, a current project. Just about what you, we started to describe a new way of thinking where you expand the project, you expand the problem. Yeah, so it could be beyond, you know, obviously beyond the, the object, the building, thinking about, you know, for the, the Muslim community, it'll be like um, recovery and healing and um, thinking about, um, you know, they want a super mosque and, you know, a living mosque maybe. And, you know, how people can be educated through the process and how the, a project can create this um, new feeling for them of, safety, security, and just um, starting to think about how we're living together and environmental um, sustainability. So should we have two minutes to do that? Well, I think spend two minutes at least on those two. How can your project add value to the larger system and how can the larger system add value to your project? Those are the two questions that we focus on. Okay, so um, shall we um, share some of the conversations? I think, you know, with the, the mosque project, I started to think about um, kind of widening the, the conversation. And, you know, one of the things there was that the history of the land, it used to be a marae, and they want the design to be of Christchurch and Maori architecture um, and not some sort of pastiche Islamic um, import and but sort of incorporating different elements together so you know that was kind of what I started to talk about but um, can someone start the conversation with share share what there's a bit of a buzz there so there must be something we were just talking about roading so concrete versus dust seal um, and we just kind of just got into it but it's actually something really interesting to think about the whole that longevity of a, of a product, um, concrete versus the seal. The seal has a sort of 10-ish life, life span, but it also has the pothole issues. Concrete has a, do you know what the actual life span is? Um, with the roads, I think they always define the factory in the air before they can And it depends also on axle loadings and things like that. But when we're comparing roads and seals, they are the same thing. Yeah. So you can see that the seal has a as I said, you know, you don't see the aeroplane going ka -dook, ka -dook, ka -dook, ka -dook, down the runway, you know, so there's obviously ways that you can design to, for um, longevity. Unless it's Wellington. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's only short runways. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah so we're just sort of talking about longevity and things. So, how can, so just going back to the five capitals, how would your road and value to Mrs. Papatunu or the living system? Did you think about that? It was kind of like just the end of the conversation. What yeah. we were actually talking about was a project that yeah. Yeah. Nick has got, um, where they're looking at the car parking and things, and there's, um, while it is a commercial um, 
area, there are two residential homes there, so they're worried about noise and things like that. Um, and we were still talking about well, how could you reduce that noise, even though those two houses aren't actually being used for residential or commercial. So we're just looking at how you control the noise, um, looking at what you can do for the water quality, and you can sort of add ons yep. rather than just focusing on the noise. Yep. Great. So there's quite a few things in here. Um, there's an um, uh, added shredded car tire that can go back into a mix, or so an asphalt mix. So you're, um, you're um, reusing material back into it, but also making the, the road um, do it a bit slip resistance and it does change the noise. Didn't they use yoghurt containers to make a road in Auckland? Uh, really? Yeah. And there's a, a, another project where they're um, putting uh, PV cells through the roads. Um, and, um, and then another one where they're using the, the weight of the vehicle going over a piece of road to generate electricity as well. Yes, I've heard that before. Yeah. So planting is really good for, like plant corner trees and hedges are, in the way also provide noise um, mitigation and also trap dust as well. So if you've got dust coming up, you can that could be interesting. Depending on what you know, what colour their light is always balanced, isn't it? But you know, maybe able to design some lighting to, to help mitigate. Because it's it's probably like half manufactured um, thermometers all along the side, and that could trap the mercury <laughs> from the tubes. And then um, <laughs> that's a crazy idea. <laughs> um, the other thing with roads is that's happening in certain places around the world is they're making them um, lighter colours, so you don't get that heat island effect and um, calling the cities and uh, yeah planting trees so it creates some shade um, we can go a long way by planting a lot of trees yeah um, shall we carry on so um, I'm not going to talk to I'm not going to talk about this home anymore I'm going to talk about because uh, I already have and actually this is the, the 10 star home but people can come and see this it's, it's open once a month for uh, an hour for people to have a guided tour and have a look through it first Saturday of the month. Um, but, um, and you can look at the details of that if you're interested, but a lot of, most people, probably everybody's already seen it already, but. So, <coughs> but this is a photo that my wife took. Um, she was at Westfield Mall, and um, this is uh, the back of the toilet cubicle. So you know you've made it when you make it to the back of the toilet cub cubicle. Um, so, and we've already touched on size. So there's no passageway in that home. And we've thought about eliminating waste space. Um, and, um, you know, it's got a fully insulated slab. So instead of heating the ground, we're actually heating the house, which is important. So I talk about the floors <clears throat> and it's everything, it's not so much the systems and having solar and, and um, it's how everything's integrated together. So systems thinking. So um, instead of having kind of a checklist of systems, it's kind of like a, if you, it's like an ecosystem. One, one system influences another system. So in that home, our solar is linked to our hot water and, it, and um, our hot water is linked to our underfloor. So everything's sort of linked together and working together. And that was probably one of the biggest breakthroughs that combined with not leaking heat. So our larger than normal, probably twice as big as normal hot water cylinder is our battery for thermal energy. And then our, our slab, because it doesn't leak heat, um, our slab is also a battery. Um, so we did, one of the first houses, we did recessed windows. Um, yeah, so... Um, is, that, is, you, is it showing that this slab edge is colder than the... Yeah. It's well it's colder than yeah. the wall. Yeah, so the wall... Uh, you can actually see... I don't know, it's clearer on the computer screen, but you can see the lines where the studs are. The um, orange there is about 20... The yellow is about 20, 21 degrees. And then... Um, it's a different scale, this one on the bottom here. So that is 12 to 21. This one is 1 to... Minus one to three, so the outside of the slab is uh, is about two. Um, the windows, the inside of the windows there is about fifteen de degrees, sixteen degrees, and then 
the outside of the window is about two degrees. So really good windows. And um, we've first project where we recess the window, standard practice overseas to recess windows. It makes sense. It's just putting the window in the warm part of the wall. But in New Zealand, we don't do that. Um, so we did all these things to the windows. Low E, really important. But And our windows are four times as good as double glazed aluminium windows. Um, so um, New Zealand building code, flush mounted window. Um, your, your window is sitting in your cold drainage ventilation cavity, your cladding cavity. We didn't do that. We put the window in the warm part of the wall. Um, so you don't need a warm support bar, which is basically a big heat sink or, or cold sink. Um, because the window is supported on the frame. So it's just a matter of having different um, flashings. So there's 30 seconds on windows. We did a two hour seminar on win windows in Wellington. <coughs> um, but um, the walls, you know, I put um, the jib fix. Oh no, was that jib fix? Oh no, there was a no, the jib fix. Yeah, the jib fix thing there. So this is a no brainer, you know, less timber in the walls and um, more insulation. So that's. It's cheaper. Timber costs more than insulation. Um, we removed the dwangs. So after that photo was taken, we ran around and cut the dwangs out. So there's your top one is your traditional wall setup. The bottom one is the jib fix framing system. And four years ago, I thought this will just be the new normal way of doing walls because it doesn't cost any more and it's more thermally efficient. And it's actually cheaper, but it hasn't because people don't know about it. Um, so, you know, it's not new. It's been around for a long time. In uh, America, they call it the Californian corner. So just getting rid of that cold corner and the uninsulated part where the internal wall meets the external wall. Easy. Um, Can I ask, is that straightforward to put through with the council again? Yep. They, yep. Through. Yep. So it's no problem at all. Sorry? It was actually legal. Yeah, so there is nothing in the building code to say that you have to have dwangs. So it, it, we just took them out. Off, yeah. You don't need dwangs to join plasterboard. Um, some and claim, some claims require dwangs, so <laughs> Yep, so <clears throat> if you need um, structural timber in the wall for claddings, that's uh, a good point, but you could also do, what we do is we do 45 mil structural cavity battens, so you don't actually need, um, your, your fixings for your claddings just go into your cavity battens if you beef up your ca cavity battens to 45. So it can be, can be done. Um, so this is just me running around having fun, ripping, ripping the dwangs out. I look really fat because the video stretched. <laughs> um, but that was that 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 did that was a lot of fun and it didn't take long. And well, this was the first house that we had this jib fix system. That's how they de delivered the frames. Now we just ask them, don't put dwangs in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, that's why I say we're sort of learning. But I mean, the next stage on from that is prefabricated um, wall panels, and. Um, I shouldn't have those names on there. That should have been deleted. But. So this is the this is the project where we um, we looked at um, basically Christchurch City Council saw what we were doing and they said, "Do you want a home star rate thirty four um, dwellings for this project?" And this is the existing homes, and you can see they stand out because these are, these are all beds that uh, past their use by date council flats, but Someone back, um, I don't know, 80, 90 years ago, they thought about where the sun was, and then the rest of the houses are orientated to the street. So that actually was pretty good. And then, um, so they asked me to home star rate a new design that they'd already had done, and it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't this one. This was the design that we came up with. But um, so the original design was just terraced units and, and North is this way, and the terraced units were bang, 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 like this. So you had party walls facing north. There was one unit at the end that got sun, and the rest of them, 
practically none because you had the garages on one side, a little bit of sun in the morning, not much, and then a little bit of sun in the afternoon, but all day, no sun. <coughs> so with this concept, um, well, basically I looked at it and I said, there's no point in me home star rating this because they're not even going to meet building code. They're, they're not going to be, they were aiming for a six star minimum, minimum, minimum standard. And um, I said, there's no way these are going to be six star. They're probably going to struggle to be three star. So I told them that and I was doing myself out of job because my only job was to do the home star rating. And I said, don't bother. And then luckily they said to me, well, can you redesign it for us? We'll just put that to one side. So we redesigned it and um, we took a site where there was 35 units proposed and we increased the yield to 39 and we blew it apart and we separated out the units so that they all have all day sun and almost every room has all day sun. So, you know, we need to think where is the sun, you know, and stop expecting people to live in caves. And that's a good starting point, you know. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west, in case you've forgotten, but um, these people certainly had. So this is a social housing project. So <coughs> it needed to be affordable. And, um, you know, the blue bits are social housing and then there's market housing as well. So it was a mix and then there was accessible, affordable housing. Um, and um, it was very successful. Um, but I couldn't help myself. I added in one, it was this huge tree. So we were working with existing trees and existing roading. And um, so there was a larger site. So we added in one 10 star house, but a six star version of it. And um, one, on, one on the ends of a, we did have a block of multi-unit, but it was um, facing the right direction. And um, we added a 10 star um, on the end of, of those um, 10 units. So, Tell us a little bit about the, you know, the, sort of the drivers and the thinking, your thinking that generated the plan. Because I can, it's quite, A, it's quite intriguing. B, yeah. you've done a lot of work on cars, and I was thinking about storm water as well. Yeah, well, basically, it started with how many cars to get on the site. And, you know, it's a one hectare site, it's a brownfield, it's an infill development. and you know, how do we get access for the cars? And um, so we created four courtyards um, and then we created a green space where the multi-unit was so that that could be an area for kids to play and people to come together and a bit of community. And so we were thinking about rather than building a bunch of houses with the status quo, carving up sections like they do in the subdivisions, how do we create community? And that green area was also stormwater retention underneath there. So underneath the grass, and actually underneath the linking piece of road, there was stormwater retention, um, because that was a con consideration. So, um, yeah, and you know, council looked at that, and it hasn't been built, by the way, and this was a couple of years ago, um, but because, you know, obviously they haven't been able to get their act together and sign a contract, M money will be the argument, but um, they, they said this is a nationally significant project. They loved it. They said this is what we need to be doing. So significant, we're not going to build it. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it led to nothing so far, but hopefully it, it gets picked up at some point. But, you know, it's just from a little, a little home came a big project. And then also this project here. So this is a um, concept for 50 homes up the top of the Port Hills. So again, this is a private developer who saw what we're doing in Church Square and said, yeah, we could do with some of these for downsizers, older people who want to move out of a large family home and they know kids are left home. They still want to be on the hills, um, but they don't want the maintenance and they don't want the running cost of a huge home. And um, so this was a model for something that didn't exist, particularly on the Port Hills. And um, building in orchards and gardens and community there too. So there's a, there's a community building at the centre. There's lots of different typologies to suit different, different people. Um, yeah, so I'll just keep moving. Um, so this is the 11 star home. 
which there is no such thing as 11 star home, but we, <laughs> it's, it's problematic when you do a 10, where do you go from there? But So this one we used CLT and um, uh, yeah, it was, and I think it's led to a lot of other projects where we've used CLT. So this home here, we used um, CLT for the floor, but we used eco panel for the walls, which is, um, it just feels really good, the, the eco panel, because it's it's LVL timber and it's sheep's wool and Terralano wool insulation. And it's just all natural material. So if we can use natural materials to start with and avoid using toxic materials or, or petrochemical based products, I think it's it's a good start. Um, and um, Declare and the red list is really good for that. But So this, this house, um, had a CLT floor, which was um, suspended. Um, I wonder if this works. It was really, is that gonna work? Uh, it's a little two minute video of how the floor went together. This is a um, work in progress video of a home at 35 So after the earthquakes, people are interested in something other than a concrete floor. Oh. It's, pl it's playing here, but it's not playing up there. Uh, I wonder why is it? Uh, oh, well, you're not seeing what's on my screen. I'm not sure um, how to fix that. We won't, we won't worry about that. Okay. Well, don't worry about that because if I share these slides with you, you can come back and you can look at that later. Um, but um, yeah, basically, super soft ground. Um, we did this really innovative triple T raft system. We had CLT and we had a thin concrete topping on top of it. So we still incorporated um, heating and um, really easy to re-level after an earthquake and much more sustainable because um, we had to be 900 above the ground because of a flood management zone. and we avoided taking truckloads of stuff out of there and putting in engineered fill and we avoided lots of concrete and steel and just had the suspended floor. So anyway, that, um, you know, you can, you can look at this later and um, so that's just a politically incorrect meme that I came across on the internet. <coughs> um, so this project here, uh, Julie, um, Frenchie, Julie Villard um, did, did this um, and I helped her, it's her design completely, I just helped her a little bit with um, get, getting the building consent and, and getting it built. But um, this is this picked up the award for small home and this is a um, CLT home too, but it's, it's using a lot of, it's sort of mimicking the boat sheds down the bottom there and, and the the form of it, but um, they can. It's very similar to that. So if you you look at the inside of it, um, it's all wood, and um, it's it's very European in its construction. So it's CLT. Uh, it's super insulated. It's got about this thick wood fibre insulation around the outside. Gutex, it's called, but. You know, that's a product that we don't have here that we could easily produce here. We've got loads of waste wood um, and uh, lots of wood, wood pulp. But uh, yeah, that was imported. Um, so quite an interesting, different way of looking at things. And, you know, with what we're doing as designers, um, this is just talking about systems thinking and how everything works together, but... Um, and the physics of, of building. But, you know, I really think what we're doing as designers, we just need to be bold and think differently and have the courage to do things differently. And um, this, is a, this is a good example of something that's very different in terms of its building methods and its design. Um, and Julie's done a great job of this. Um, <coughs> She said uh, she she I think she she said she had the most difficult client, and I think it might have been her partner. But it's a good test of a relationship when you build a house together, <coughs> um, and they're still together at the end of it. Sorry, on that 
slide. Oh, so they've got steel portals and then steel. Yeah, it's kind of a hybrid, oh. and it's because of the engineer. Um, the engineer was a steel guy. Um, so, you know, there was a point where they said, can we have no steel on this? And, and they probably could have if they'd chosen the right engineer or they'd redesigned it to have no steel. Um, but it's going to be the last house standing if there's an earthquake. Um, so, you know, Julie, um, she would say, uh, I've taught her everything she knows, but I think it's the other way around. So I've learned a lot from, um, from her about how things are done from you know, a European pers perspective. And um, yeah, so that's, that's an interesting case study. Um, can, can I ask a cross lab? Because I was looking at cross lab stuff and then realised it's got glues and formaldehyde. One, one cross lab's got a declare label. There is one type now, because I was looking the, to see back. <coughs> the only challenge is if you use it for a bathroom where they Council require greater timber treatment for wet areas, okay. but typically, it's treated with boron. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so it was. Yeah. So this house. Um, I don't know. Did anyone go on the super homes tour? Yeah. So this that house was on um, last year's tour. So that was one of the twelve homes. We Homestar rated all the homes last year, which was a real effort. <coughs> um, so this, this year we did it differently. We had um, uh, nine homes over one weekend instead of 12 homes over three weekends. And um, they weren't all home star rated. Some of them were. Um, so the, but there was a good, like I was talking about before, there's a good variety of homes from sort of small um, to, to large and even a renovation. So I think renovations are really important. So we're not going to fix the problems of the world by just building new homes better. We need to look at upgrading our existing housing stock. Um, yeah, so commercial building stock and the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Did they get the renovation because it's like an old wooden type? Yeah, it's an old villa, eco villa. Um, that, that's a, actually travellers' accommodation, and um, they did a really good job of that, and they upcycled a lot of the materials. And um, yeah, so it's a really interesting project. Um, Did you homestyle that one? No, but um, yeah, so probably one, probably my next project might be a super reno with um, a, a demonstration project looking at how to renovate a villa. Because I've got a lovely old villa which is freezing cold that needs some work. <coughs> um, I make a you do a bit of research and a bit of sort of setup, but then you could actually host an ADNZ design jam around all the different ways that a villa could be retrofitted and upgraded and, and use the intelligence of the group to help you. Because mm. um, one solution, you know, look at, look at the whole and then see what's right for your particular project, but there may be other things that are different for other projects. So mm. Design jam, I like the sound of that, that's cool. Yeah. And then it gets the yeah. information out there quickly in yeah. terms of the thinking. Yeah. And I think it's a really good point because this tour showed that there's there's lots of different ways of doing things and they're all good. So there's not one way of doing it. And you know, there's different people like different things, have, have different priorities. So, you know, there's a passive you can't see it, it's at the bottom of the screen here, but there's a passive house here and it's beautiful. It's got it's on the hill, it's got a million dollar view. And it's got lovely big windows. And, um, you know, I always thought you can do that, do passive house and do a really um, aesthetically pleasing, um, beautiful piece of architecture. It's just a lot of the passive houses are quite, they're sort of rectangular with small windows because they have this form factor in there. They're more probably engineering type people thinking about the numbers. Um, instead of thinking about the quality of the architecture. So bringing those two things together, quality architecture and performance, I think is the, the winning combination. And they shouldn't be mutually exclusive. Um, you know, it's, it's puzzled me, but it's either that or it's 
they spent all the money on the performance and they didn't have money for the architecture. <laughs> I don't know. I'm being a bit facetious. Yeah. So um, I'll probably just um, hand over to Jerome now. And uh, we don't, we've got about 20 minutes left. Yep. So have you done enough? Oh, should I do the we stuck to him. Look, most of this is, um, I'll speak loudly for the video. Most of this is, uh, we're not going to do any more uh, case studies. Um, Bob beat me to it on that. This is what I would like you to work on. So, understand purpose, working with potential. So, I sort of alluded at, at the beginning that, um, you know, working with the restorative thing, working with problems is a bit demotivating. Somebody's broken something and they're asking somebody else to fix it. But um, a living system, a place, a community always has potential to evolve and to be better than it was before, healthier, flourishing, more, more life, and that's typically the path. But every place, every person, every business, every institution is unique. It has its own sort of essence and driver that makes it what it is. And that, that essence or that purpose is what powers it through cycles of regeneration over time. And um, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to have a little bit of a stab at doing a purpose statement. And this is okay, we've got 10, 15 minutes. And, um, but being purposeful is really powerful because it helps drive us through it. It's the guiding star when we're being battered by challenges and budget and new technologies and things like that. It's the guiding star that keeps us on track and keeps us heading towards where we know we need to be. So typically a purpose statement has, has three parts to it. What, what, what we're transforming, so what's the potential of this place or this project or this business to grow from where it is today into a, a, into a physically different end state, which is actually the potential for the next state, and so on and so forth. And the being, what new capability will be delivered as a result of this transformation? How will our family or our community or our business um, function better, be more aware, be more capable? And what new value will get created for something larger than the project itself? And this, this bit down the bottom is just a, a different way of saying this, this is the same as the bit up here. So to make some kind of transformation in a way that, so that the source of motivation is in service so larger. So have a quick think. This could be, um, for Bernice, it could be Firth, Inc. What would, you know, what's the purpose of Firth? Could be a project that you're working on currently, or, or could be an, a project that you've already done and you're thinking, oh, I've had more potential than I gave it credit for. Or it could be your own business, you know, your own design practice. Or for Bernadette, it could be Ara. Or maybe the architect's department. ADNZ. What's the purpose of ADNZ? And, and the, the, the challenge here is to think about how your business, your project, is going to serve the larger system. Mm -hmm. Because that's what creates the will and motivation. And that's what happens when people look at your business. They go, oh, wow, they're doing this. I want, I want to hang out with them. I want to buy their products. I want, to, I want some of that architecture because that helps, going to help me. So purpose is infectious. Purpose is motivating. And, um, and if this is a chance, there's no, there's no real rules, it's a chance to think, well, how could I leverage what I do to help the bigger system? Okay? You're five at the back because you're texting. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. No, he's just texting to tell people how great this has been. Um, Brilliant. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. So look, this, and like I say, this is a practice. Just have a go at doing it. It doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong answers. And I've got to say, the more you do this, the better you'll get at it. And, and it is useful to be purposeful because, like I said, people are drawn to that. Mm. So.
go on, just have a go. And then we'll have a listen in to what you've got. Anybody want to care to share what you've been um, working on? I mean, I'm just working on a project that's going to um, have a lot of public in the building. Um, and so I've just been thinking about telling the actual story of the thinking that's gone in behind the building. So actually talking about what things are made out of, why we chose certain things, and what the impact of those are. Um, and also, um, I'm going to try and incorporate uh, some sort of visual interest in those materials as well, um, so that people can physically sort of see what's in behind the walls um, and potentially you, adopt you've, that. You've hit the nail on the head. What we relate to in other people or businesses is their why, which is the similar to the purpose, yeah. which is the direction. I do something because I believe this, and that that idea of sharing the thinking behind the building is really powerful, so that's good. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Bernice? Mm, I'm not sure if I got the right thing, but anyway, I, I made like a statement of, yeah, so I just said, on the road to a better future, my function is to change, my being is the ripple to a wave, and it's by bringing people on the journey, because I think if we just suddenly we go, here it is, people haven't come along that journey and they need to come along that journey to really get an understanding of what the goal is. So the thing that might aid that is to just be clear about what you're changing. So to be really, okay, we've got a, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but in the sense that, you know, the, the current industry doesn't perform. It delivers loss of value, poor quality. So we want to change it into something that creates value for you know our investments or something so you could tune that up a little bit i think also the change is actually to make people act because there's a lot of um talk and yeah. you know, even coming out of here you know people actually have to act on what you guys have so i'd say that the have a very particular character and quality and history and you can if you look back over that history you'll see some of that essence coming through and so your purpose as as Firth is quite unique compared to other and other company. It's drilling into that a little bit and thinking about what it is and how and bringing that into your purpose statement. But look, this is just a first cut. It's just an opportunity to give it a go and start thinking more purposefully. Up in the back. Yes. Yeah. Hola. Hola. Um, I think that my purpose is and then I am from is yes, um, try to integrate all the um, design and of course the healthy design with the um, interior and exterior. I found in New Zealand that it's all very separate. So I've been working in the kitchen for a long time here in New Zealand and then I can't go out to the kitchen. For me it was easier because just I tried the computer and then but as I've been working um, as an interior architect and doing a couple of renovations. And then it's because I know the clients and they know what I can give them. And so trying to integrate the healthy home is, is all packaged because, of course, you need the box, but then you live inside. Uh, the distribution, the spaces, of course, the energy that is inside. Uh, I've just been looking at a couple of things about the geobiology as well. How the third so, what's your purpose? What's your purpose statement? It's trying to integrate gotcha. Gotcha. And then, yes, so the, the people here, I think that it's hard to see all the globe together, all in the same oh, box. So. You know? Yeah, I think that's a really important thing, just looking at holistically, looking at everything yeah. and how it works together. Yeah. <clears throat> also, if I've been designing a kitchen, I always have been looking who was the architect, the materials that they use, why the client choose them, because of course it's part of the it's not just units. Cool. Okay. okay, thank I'll you. Give, sometimes I feel like when I give, I give up, yeah. I wish to do basic kitchen, but then of course I have uh, options now to do another project, so I wish to do So we often find we'll have a go to purpose statements at the beginning of the project. You know, we'll have a few meetings, we'll be doing a bit of work, and we'll learn stuff, we'll understand stuff, and we tune that purpose statement up, we sharpen it up and make it more powerful. Yeah. Anybody else? Monsieur? 
I was just thinking about my place kind of retrospectively because I'm uh, from a farming background, so I like my green space and things like that. So, um, and then I talked to my neighbours, and they all used to this particular lot that I was going to build on being empty for like a decade. So it was always grass for them and it gets painted on and things like that. So I kind of changed my design there, from the draftsman's perspective, through the house, out of the building. So there's all the grass underneath. Pushed it back in the section so it's also in the space. Right. And it sits nice and high so you can find everybody else and you've got the privacy and things like that. Oh, so a lot of that was kind of touched on here, but I never really thought about that. So that's interesting that just that, that delay gave you a opportunity to see what the land wanted to be, wanted to do. And, and then it took, then you responded to that and designed it in a slightly different way. That's a beautiful story. Thank you. Cool. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, um, for my business. Um, just trying to get a, um, a statement that works in with that. So um, to, um, to change how we look at the world in a way that uplifts it, inspires, so that at the heart of what we do will always be creativity and excellence. Sure. Yeah. That's it. a good foundation. <laughs> Give that a whirl anyway. <laughs> Anybody else? Vicky? Um, well we've, I've got a, a section, so that will be our, like, my, that's our opportunity to build. And um, I've sort of really got, I'm totally very environmentally aware and have got some of the more the, the broader skills and knowledge that I can hopefully bring to the designer and work. And I want to really try and see just how affordable can we make it, just how small can we make a, a, you know, a family of two kids. And I'd like to then be able to share that. And water's been yeah. the thing that I've focused on, how we integrate water and water management. It's on the Lurs, on yeah. the slight hillside. So just looking at how to shape, so I, we're looking at, well, I've looked at it and thought, okay, previously the driveway went up the hill, but actually we on a corner, so we can take a driveway in on the side, which yeah. means it's level, therefore we can start to do things like permeable paving, or maybe just gravel that can, you know, you can change the way the layout is. So there's a lot going, you're flicking up, you're moving up and down between these levels, just in that conversation you had with me. Yeah. So your purpose statement is this bit, yeah. And I think, I, I can see that your project is going to be a success, but I'm going to suggest that you really spend some time on your purpose statement. Just take a photograph of that slide now, all of you, just so you've got it, because we will issue these, but we've got to do a bit of tuning on them and stuff. And... Um, you work on that purpose statement. Make sure it captures what you're thinking and feeling and that it addresses other members of your family who are going to be involved in it. Talk to Bob a bit. And, um, I thought the, the first piece of that was your purpose. And yes, so I've already decided. And I think... So it's going to be affordable. It's going to um, look at the water system, the larger water system, mm -hmm. and it's going to do it in such a way that it shares this information with other people and stuff. So tune that up. And it's going to be... That's the other thing, isn't it, about... Oh, dear. Law of three. We have to address... We cannot... We cannot come out of here and talk about compromise. We have to address this. There's that pen. So, an act, just pump it up. An activating force. I want to build a building. Okay. Bang. What happens? Constraints. We have council resource consent, we have budget, we have all sorts of issues. What do we do typically? We, uh, uh, we compromise. Compromise? Compromise. Compromise. I'll, I'm a developer, I want to do something a little bit bad. I'll give you a little bit of a park in the city. And just we'll do a deal and sort it out. Good for me, good for you. Where do you end up with if you keep compromising? Ticky ticky blend. You end up in the gutter. You how low can you go? So what we like to say is, if we really understand what the essence of the activation is, what's really going on, and we really understand the essence of the constraints, this is, this is evolution. We can harmonize them or reconcile we can find something that's new and better out of that interaction this is what nature does this is what this is what is evolution 
This is humans in transactional deals trashing the planet. There's always going to be constraints, but it's a matter of prioritising, isn't it? Yeah, well, exactly. That's what I'm meaning, sorry. But, but you didn't mean compromise, that's OK. But to me, compromise isn't a bad thing. It's looking at how you make the most of what you have. You know, let's be realistic, there is a finite budget here. So how do yeah. I make the most of that? That's what yeah. I'm trying to say. How do I make the most of that budget and look both analytically and, you know... Compromise well. means I, you know... the. I want to be really clear because it is at the heart of our journey. Compromise means I can build over the best farmland in New Zealand, be it in South Auckland or in the burbs of Christchurch. I can, I'm going to do a big development. There's five streams on the land. It means I can kill five streams and let two live. That's compromise for you. Thank you. How powerful is language? Okay. But for you, your purpose statement is going to really help crystallise how you're going to approach this project. Where are we at? We've sort of run out of time. Did anybody else want to really want to say something or contribute? How did you get on with your purpose statements, ADNZ? We got on a different tangent, but um, one of the things I think that is really key is that you've got to say uh, the purpose is to motivate. You know, and I actually think I haven't even gone deeper than that, but that's what we're here to do. Yeah. You know, and we've actually, we've got in our office, we've got like 23 success criteria, it's all about those things, and you know, so there's a lot of stuff that we're working for at the moment, and especially with the New Zealand board and lots of stuff, but um, and personally, I just think our job is to actually motivate, and that's in terms of motivate, as a national office, motivate for our designers, what they what they pay for is a membership. Yeah. The national office to help motivate yeah. them, and actually take to bring that to the public and motivate the public to actually to know yeah. what they don't cover, and that this is this is available, this is an option for them, this is. You know, walking, so walking the talk. Yeah. How about uh, AD and Z declare a climate emergency? Yes. Mm -hmm. How about that? Yeah. And can't use toxic chemicals anymore in our building products. Little charter, doesn't have to be a single side of A4. Climate emergency, no toxics, support the health of the living system. We actually put ourselves out there and go, yeah. this is who we are, yeah. this is what we stand yeah. for, and you know. Tune yeah. up that yeah. competency. competency. Yeah. Why, why don't you try and get someone that, um, from the group that's actually, oh sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry. Okay, I was just gonna say, potentially, a house they designed, get obviously the sign off of the person that owns it. This is what this cost. This is what a super home type house cost. The environmental effects on the both of them. And sort of trying to get something that's really comparable. So it's like, wow, it's dollar for dollar. And why not grab an ADNZ architect and use them? You know, it'll, you'll get a better product at the end of it, sort of thing. It's like a, trust me, you know? it's already there. Yeah, go, go. <laughs> Okay. You ask it, you ask anybody. Yeah. In our office, um, uh, uh, yeah, so it's uh, um, 100%. So we pretty much have to wrap it up there. Bob's got a meeting at one pretty urgent, important meeting. Um, I would really encourage you to, if you have the, can find the time, to um, come on the Creating Living Buildings course, because then you get two days. It's a bit more structured. You bring a project with you, and you can apply this thinking as you learn to the project. Bob's done it. Bernadette's done it. And... Um, yeah, Bernice has done it too, yeah. so fantastic. And, uh, and join the super home movement. Yeah, join the super home movement, <laughs> etc. Um, at the moment, Bernadette's we're, um, in it's about $850, but we're looking at trying to provide bursaries. For yeah, our find sponsors. a sponsor who will um, provide um, just a few bursaries for the very businesses. small businesses that yeah. um, can't um, afford the whole wank, which is quite common, small design practices. Okay, thank you very much for turning out this morning. You are the committed core. I don't know where your other 200 companions are. Um, yeah. They'll be getting a little letter. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Go and talk to 10 people. <coughs> yeah, and thanks you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.